Kant took up the task of developing a systematic metaphysics at a time when the smart money was that it was a waste of time. Science had progressed to the point, mathematics had progressed to the point where the wor world of thought, the Enlightenment world, knew what it was doing and the metaphysicians actually should just trouble themselves. So the state of metaphysics was something of a wreckage. And many of the wiser heads thought that it could be safely regarded entirely. And so I usually like to begin these lectures with Kant's insistence that even as you set out to ignore metaphysics, you're probably engaged in some form of metaphysical speculation yourself. He says that the human mind will ever give up metaphysical research is as little to be expected as that we should prefer to give up breathing altogether to avoid inhaling impure air. There will therefore always be metaphysics in the world. Nay, everyone, especially every man of reflection, will have it and for want of a recognized standard will shape it for himself after his own pattern. So you're going to do this whether you like it or not and one of the objectives of the critique is to have us do it the right way. The results, as you very well know, are mixed. Not only mixed, but many regard the project as a dead letter. Jonathan Bennett, in the Philosophical Review some years ago, wrote this. He said, most of the critique of pure reason is prima facie dead because prima facie dependent on wholly indefensible theories. So the commentator's dominant problem is to display the life below the surface. Now, I think that this autopsy report uh, was surely premature because in the 40 years since, since Bennett reached that conclusion, don't ask how many hundreds and even thousands of dissertations, journal articles, books, treatises, presentations from lecturers have been addressed to this alleged corpse. It's a case of mistaken identity, I should think. I think the dead body that Bennett found was a body that he had misidentified. But Kant faced this in his own time, after the first edition, which came out in 1781. It was obvious in no time that both friends and critics systematically misunderstood what he was trying to convey. Kant reacted to criticism with his characteristic, intemperate, frustrated impatience. He refers to, quote, incompetent judges who, while they would have an old name for every deviation from their perverse though common opinion, and never judge of the spirit of philosophical nomenclature, but cling to the letter only, are ready to put their own conceits in the place of well-defined notions and therefore deform and distort them. But his critics did have a leg to stand on and if you've been wading through the first critique you'll be sympathetic with the frustration of critics who are often not clear as to just what not only what Kant means but what the purpose of the entire project is. What is the project of the first critique? What's he trying to do? It's not enough rather airily to say put metaphysics on a scientific foundation because we've yet to define metaphysics or come to some agreement as to what Kant would mean by scientific, let alone putting something on a foundation. Sebastian Gardner, who has provided nothing less than a guidebook to the first critique, Sebastian Gardner says this, this is all by way of encouraging you to approach the book with great optimism and cheerfulness. Sebastian Gardner says, virtually every sentence of the critique presents difficulties. Attempts have been made to provide commentaries comprehensively illuminating, uh, com comprehensively illuminating each individual section of the work and some of these run to several volumes without getting near its end. And then one commentator, com noting what it's like to read the Critique of Pure Reason, says it is, quote, a disagreeable task because the work is dry, obscure, opposed to all ordinary notions, and long-winded as well. Who said that? 
Kant. <laughs> in the prolegomena, this is his this is his reflection on the critique of pure reason. A disagreeable task, dry, obscure, opposed to all ordinary notions, and long-winded as well. So you should be very enthusiastic now about taking up the first critique based on these judgments. Kant got to this uh, uh, during his pre-critical years. He was a highly published scholar. His interests were wide-ranging. They, they included issues in law and in science and particularly astronomy. Uh, he's, he is a scholar of consequence and he would have been a notable scholar had he never taken up this project at all. He gets to it through a rather winding path. Uh, a, a lot of it is hit and miss. You can tell from the correspondence he has with friends and admirers that he's heading toward the critique of pure reason, but he's not quite sure what the model should be and, and, the, and the best way to get there. He's, he's living in a divided world. He's living in a world of Newton and Leibniz, a world of British empiricism focused on observation and measurement, and a world of traditional rationalist approaches to difficult problems, where if you're the right person sitting in the right armchair, you should be able to deduce the facts of the world. And Kant is trying to be at home and even reconcile those two worlds. The first sign of, of real progress comes ten years before the first edition of the first critique. He's writing a letter to Marcus Hertz, former student, a doctor, an interesting fellow in his own right. Uh, Marcus Hertz, I think, was the first medical school faculty member to admit and teach Jewish students uh, at a Prussian university. And Hertz himself did a fair amount of writing, and he was a very loyal, faithful correspondent uh, of Kant's, uh, deeply interested in Kant as a person and in his work. And Kant, Kant was rather self-disclosing in his letters to Hertz. He says to Hertz that he's, well, he's, he's on to it now. It's 1771. He's working on something he's tentatively titled On the Limits of Sensibility and Reason. So we can see that this is uh, uh, forecasting what the major work will be. He describes himself in his approach to these subjects as suffering from a mania for systematizing. You may have noticed those clinical signs if you've been thumbing through the critique of pure reason. A veritable mania for system. If the thing were outlined to any more molecular level, it would be a book of outlines, do you see? And in the German, it's much more outlined. He expresses an urgency in his letters to Hertz. He sees time running out. He's still not quite sure how to get to this. Well, what is the question? The question is how far our knowledge can reach, the extent to which we can rely on our senses and the extent to which we can rely on reason. He recognizes that the ultimate arbiter in matters of this kind has always been human rationality, but no one has taken the time to test the measuring instrument. That is, if the gold standard for whether an argument succeeds or not is rationality itself, one has to assess the instrument. How good a thermometer is it? What does its nature bring to the table as it sets about to make judgments about its own productions? And Kant, I think, is quite original in that regard. He understands that the senses and reason are both limited, but limited how? Now, um, what was the project? If someone were to ask you, as one day you will be asked if you're doing philosophy here, one of those easy questions, what was Kant's project in the first critique? You have three hours. What, what, will, what will you say that the project is? 
Uh, Karl Amerix, who is a distinguished Kant scholar, sees contemporary Kant scholarship as giving us three alternatives. Uh, Amerix adds, adds a fourth. First, to develop a systematic metaphysics serving as a refutation of skepticism. So the gray eminence here, of course, is Hume, who awakened Kant from his dogmatic slumber, and one certainly can read the first critique as a sustained defense of our epistemic resources against Hume-type skepticism, which is the most developed form of what might be called the empiricist path to skepticism. Now, what, what is it about empiricism that, that culminates in, in skepticism, in, in some form of skepticism? On the traditional empiricist account, we do not have direct access to the facts of the external world. That is, we do not experience externality directly, but only mediately. Not immediately, but mediately, because between us and the external world are those, what do you call them? Oh yes, sense organs. And so the question is how faithfully they report what is going on out there. Well, to raise the question, how faithful is the sensory report of the external world, is to assume that you have some reliable, non-sensory way of answering that question. That's the box you can't get out of. And so there is always this gap between reality, as it might possibly be known by some non-human creature, and reality as empirically sampled by the senses whose limitations and distortions are very well known, but not perfectly classified or categorized or, or measured. So there is that problem. You do the best you can. Uh, how good are the senses? Well, we got to the moon and came back. So they're obviously reporting something reasonably well. But if you're serious about epistemology, then you have reservations about all knowledge grounded in sense experience. So there's that problem. Call it uh, the lock problem. Or, but call it whatever problem you like. It, it, it's, it's one of the consequences, certainly, of a radical empiricism. And there are gambits that can be invoked to, uh, uh, apart from Kantian ones, you could adopt a, a form of realism, a Thomas Reed type realism, according to which the alleged gap is not a gap at all. In fact, you see what is there. Your knowledge of the external world is immediate, not mediated. And I shall have a few things to say about that, maybe even today, and surely in the course of these lectures. Well, you might also say that the project of the first critique is to develop a metaphysical system that will provide the right kind of foundation for science. And I, I, I lean in the direction of Kant attempting to develop an argument that will ground the objectivity of science. That is to say, Kant is not trying to redeem the wisdom of the plain man. He recognizes the errors that ordinary thought is would be prone to. But he also recognizes the profound success of the Newtonian project, the 17th century project, the age of Newton and Galileo and company. And this surely can't be based on iffy and, and, and epistemically chancy Hume-type uh, uh, vulnerabilities. So what metaphysical foundation at once respects the achievements of science and provides a grounding so that science itself understands the basis upon which its claims ultimately depend? One might argue that that is the project of the first critique. Amerix gives us a third option, which is the enduring problem, he calls it the enduring problem of ontology. Now what is ontology? Well you all know what ontology is, you're philosophy students. Willard Van Orman Quine says the nice thing about ontology is that it can be defined exhaustively by three monosyllabic English words. What is there? 
Well, what is there? Now, Locke, surely one of the fathers of modern modern day British empiricism, was at pains to argue that the endless metaphysical disputes about the real essence of things were idle to begin with because we lack the capacity to know the real essence of anything. All we have is what Locke referred to as the nominal essence of things. It's the way we, in virtue of the way we perceive and, 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 and cogitate, it's the way we come to label things, people and carpets and light bulbs and computers. We give things names based on general characteristics and it's largely the, the shared experiences of a community that settles on the meaning of a term. As for the real essence of things, that's beyond the reach, beyond, beyond the reach of our, our very senses. Now how does Locke come to a conclusion like that? Well, he is an older friend of that very clever young fellow, uh, Isaac Watts his name. And according to Newton, uh, ultimate reality is corpuscular. That is to say, the ultimate material basis of everything is beyond our visual capabilities. So the real essence of, you know, this is how Locke spins out the particular theory of mind that he advances in an essay concerning the human understanding. Uh, what are ideas? Ideas are something fabricated out of elementary sensations. Well, how does that work? Well, elementary sensations are very much like the corpuscular elements of uh, mind, do you see? Now, by a process of association, these elementary sensations are pulled together to form elementary ideas. And what is that process of association like? It's like gravitational forces that pull together corpuscles to form more complex bodies. So Locke is already giving us something of a Newtonian theory of mind. And on that account, of course we can't know the real essence of things. No, no, even a bug can't know the real essence of things. The real essence of things is something very small. But that's not the level at which we examine things. We examine things at this level, and at this level we give things names based on what? Based on the use we make of them and the traffic that we have with them in actual life. Well, this then does create something of an ontological problem. The problem is, all right, we've got these nominal essences, these things we've given names to, but what really is there? And in case you're hearing something of a bat squeak of Kantian noumena uh, sneaking in at this point, you, you're, you're hearing aptly, you're hearing aptly that there is an aspect of reality which is inferable but not knowable. And the Kantian noumena are not entirely removed from the Lockean real essences. Oh, I can almost hear Kant scholars screaming in protest. They, they usually take something for that. Uh. Now, Karl Americh uh, argues that Kant was aware of all three of these uh, issues, but he finally settled on a modest fourth option, which Americh refers to as the transcendental option, that would unearth and delineate the conditions necessary for both the scientific and the manifest images of the world, the transcendental option. I will get to Kant and his neologistic use of transcendental a little, a little later. Well, Kant says, this is at B10, when one's reason has learned completely to understand its own power in respect of objects which can be presented to it in experience, it should easily be able to determine with completeness and certainty the extent and the limits of its attempted employment beyond the bounds of experience. Once reason sees what it is doing with the input, if I can use that horrid language, it's because that thing was 
so difficult to turn off today. I'm going to start talking about inputs. I'm sure I am. Andy, stop me before I sin again. Yes, all right. Once, once reason has a way of reckoning what it does with the contents of experience, how it works on the contents of experience, half the muddle is taken care of already, and this is why we need a critique, a critical assessment of how reason operates, what its limits, what its limits are. Kant raises a very interesting question, which I think is probably the best way into the first critique. He raises a question in the prolegomena. The question is, how is nature possible? How is nature possible? Think about this. He defines nature as the existence of things so far as it is determined according to universal laws. Now what is he getting at with this? Look, here we sit, well you sit, I stand. Here we stand and sit in a veritable hurricane of stimulation. Showers of quanta Sounds which, if you were very attentive, you would begin to hear. Listen. See. Things you're touching. Surfaces that you think are hard, though they're not. Well, they're hard, but they're not what you think. You've got this tremendous bath of stimulation. Disconnected. How bad is it? Well, the olfactory epithelial cells of the canine will respond to the dissipation of one molecule of fatty acid. Do you see? This is why Argos detects Odysseus that the minute he gets within smelling range, say, there's Odysseus pretending to be me. And there's Argos who spots him after all these years and dies. I mean, the, the very fact of Odysseus's survival shocks him so. So Argos picks up the smell. Your dog will pick you up maybe a third of a mile away without wind. Do you see? The best studies of energy at the threshold of human vision indicate that if we can successfully get two or three quanta to a retinal cone, it will excite a visual response. You generally have to bang the cornea with about 150 of them, because half of what arrives at the cornea is reflected back, and then there's more reflection off the anterior surface of the lens, etc., etc. But if you can get a few to the retina, you'll excite a visual response. Audition is sensitive at the level of Brownian motion. If you haven't done any physics, may I say to you, that is a very low volume. Since most of you have blown out your auditory mechanism with what you refer to as music, you don't have to worry about hearing anything at the level of Brownian motion. You'll be lucky if you hear a streetcar coming, bearing down on you. But the auditory system is, it, well, you see the problem, don't you? You've got all that going on and hitting a system that's responsive to just about everything. How out of that morass do you get tables and chairs and people and symphonies and rules of law and trees and agricultural principles and shipping vessels, etc. How do you get the law-governed world of science, given that, that rash, that epidemic of sensory experiences? What makes that possible? And Kant is satisfied that empiricism doesn't even have a way of addressing the question, let alone settling it. The human being, as a passive recipient to these tidal waves of stimulation, would, in the words of Sir Thomas Brown, in, that's a wonderful passage in Religio Medici where 
Thomas Brown refers to one as staring about with a gross rusticity. Well, we'd go through life staring about with a gross rusticity. What was that? Oh God, what was that? Oh, what was that? You see? As opposed to the lunar excursion model and coming back to Earth, orbiting the moon, etc. How is all that possible? And Kant is going to argue that all that is possible because of what we bring to this otherwise tidal wave of stimulations. The order that we impose on it. That the knowledge we have in fact is a reflection of the very rational and perceptual principles that operate as we confront the world. Now you say to yourself, well for goodness sake, what's new in that? Here's what's new in that. Anyone taking the, that part of the empiricist story according to which our knowledge of the external world is never immediate but mediate recognizes that we are imposing some kind of effect on whatever it is that gets to us. That's old hat. Nemo discensit bis in idem fluminem. No one ever steps into the same river twice. Everything's in flux, do you see? The trick that Kant has to pull off is how to save, in light of all that, how to save what I prefer to think of as the scientific image from rank subjectivity. That's the burdensome part of the task, to acknowledge what we are doing by way of constructing a lawful reality and at the same time saving the resulting image from, as I say, rank subjectivity. Now, he wants to save philosophy from something else. Next week I shall go into a little more detail on this. A number of scholars have wondered why Kant is so harsh in the prolegomena in his treatment of the Scottish common sense school, the school of Reed, Oswald, Beatty, and others. And I think Manfred Keane has, has the right answer to that. Uh, Kant is part of a war within German philosophy. It, it has whiskers. It, it was there before Kant was even a student. And, and the war is between those who would make philosophy a systematic, scientific in that sense of systematic, subject, and those who would attempt to reconcile uh, philosophy to the ordinary understandings of the ordinary person. Indeed, reconcile philosophy to the claims of religion in such a way as to appeal to persons of ordinary perception and judgment. This gives rise really to two rather distinct schools of philosophy within the German intellectual world. The Schulphilosophie, which is the academic philosophy that Kant will defend all of his life, and the Popular Philosophie, which is, as the term suggests, something much more accessible to ordinary sensibilities. Kant, I think, pegged the Scottish common sense school as so close to the popular philosophy as to put some distance between it and himself. This is the only explanation for the uh, rather trivializing reference to Reed, Oswald, uh, and Beatty, because there's much in Kant that is redolent of Reedian common sense philosophy. So a few words about Reed. Um, if Thomas Reed were alive and thriving, to, well he wouldn't be thriving today because he was 54 years old before his first book came out, which means he would have been let go about 25 years before he had any occasion to write anything. Uh, he wasn't a plotter. He, he was careful, thoughtful. 
probably the scientifically most prepared mind of the period. He knew the math. He knew the. He was an expert in geometry. He was an expert in. Well, I could go on about about Reed. We, we've rediscovered Reed, long forgotten. I think the first uh, uh, paper that I published on Reed was 1978, and good scholars would look you in the eye and say, "Thomas, who?" Well, that's no longer the case. Reed's uh, Inquiry into the Human Mind is a book you can take to the beach. You, you will enjoy it. It's well written. It's humorous in places. Reed's concern is that philosophical skepticism will create a wreckage out of philosophy itself. He's particularly concerned with the influence that Hume's philosophy is likely to have. Not because it startles, but because it makes virtually no contact with the successful dimensions of life. That is to say, everything about which Hume raises a skeptical challenge is something that must be taken for granted in all of the ordinary affairs of life. And read works Hume against himself in this regard. If you, if, if you read Hume on causality in, in the treatise, and mind you, if Hume awakened Kant, it wasn't the treatise, because although the treatise comes before the inquiry, the treatise was not available to Kant. Kant read Hume's inquiry, but not the treatise, which I think is one of the reasons why he, he never got caught up in the personal identity issue, which is so fully explored in the treatise, not so much at all really in the inquiry. But what is, what is Hume arguing for regarding causality? Hume gives us the, the you know, this, uh, thing. I see before me uh, on a billiard table uh, two balls, one moves, it hits the other, the other moves, quote, I must own, I, I cannot see some third term betwixt them. Ball one moves, hits ball two, ball two moves. What is it that Hume can't see between those events? He can't see a cause. He can't see a cause, so where is causality? Causality isn't on the billiard table. Causality is a habit of the mind fabricated out of repeated experiences. Thus, whenever two events are constantly conjoined in experience, it becomes habitual for us to assume that one causally brings about the other. And since this is an habitual feature of our own mental machinery, which after all could be other than what it is, Hume reaches the rather startling conclusion, quote, that anything may be the cause of anything. That is, you could reconstitute sentient life in such a way that the causal connections would be understood in radically different ways. This just happens to be the way we do it. And then Hume assures us that, of course, when he leaves the privacy of his study and goes out into the light of day, he thinks the way ordinary people think, that this is a philosophical insight on his part. Reed has a bit of fun with that. He says, so you see then, Mr. Hume's philosophy is very much like a hobby horse, which a man, when he is ill, can keep home with him and ride to his contentment. But just in case he should bring it into the marketplace, his friends would quickly impanel a jury and confiscate his estates and have the solicitude never to leave him alone. Now, what Reed wants to make clear is that there are certain first principles on which all thought depends. These are principles of common sense, he says, which we are under an obligation to take for granted in all of the ordinary affairs of life. Quote, even the lowly caterpillar will crawl across a thousand leaves until it finds the one that's right for its diet. It does not do this by way of metaphysical speculation. In fact, 99 times in 100, the most decisive 
moves we make, the initiatives we take, are non-deliberative. You will not be deliberating the movements associated with riding a bike, getting a forkful of something into your mouth, picking up the phone. The, these, the, it's not just the picking up of the phone, it's understanding that whatever laws were operating that gave the telephone weight yesterday are still operating. Do you see that the laws, well, Reed didn't know about internal combustion engines, but, but if you, you go out in the morning and the car doesn't start, your first thought is not, my goodness, they've suspended the laws of the internal combustion. No, your, your first assumption is there's something wrong with the car. And that assumption, it, it's not something that you sort of grudgingly reach on the basis of it. It is a necessary part of functioning. You, you might see this as almost a kind of pre-Darwinian insight into what it is creatures of a given time and a given nature must take for granted as, to get across the street. Now, what Reed wants to argue is that a philosophy that officially opposes this, that holds up before a rational being the spectacle of its most basic conceptions being fatally philosophically flawed is a philosophy that's going to have a very very brief shelf life people will look at it and they'll smile at the cleverness of the person who advanced it and then they will get on with the business of life but reading really principles of common sense have a kind of cousinship with some of the apparatus that you will see Kant developing under the pure categories of the understanding and under the core principles of perception. So that's a rather long-winded way of saying that there are some Reedian anticipations of Kant. And then the question is, since Kant didn't read English, did he read Reed? And I do want to say that uh, Kant, by the way, took some pride in the fact that his ancestry was Scottish, that the name Kant itself is a corruption of a Scottish name. And um, we know how avidly he pursued the productions of the Scottish school because these in redacted form were being made available in German translations very, very quickly. Uh, Scottish philosophical thought was not remote from the German-speaking world. Um, a number of years, many years ago, oh my gosh, uh, one of my students was going to uh, do a... Um, PhD in Berlin and as we always hope our students will say professor is there anything I can do for you while I'm in Germany you've done so much for me you say <laughs> write that down I said which I rarely do yes see if you can find a German translation of Reed's inquiry that might have been available before Kant wrote the first edition of the first critique. And damn it, if there wasn't one. It's the worst thing. It was anonymously published, wisely, by the translator. It's a horrible translation. I, and, and although the timing would have been all right, I, I, I have no reason to believe Kant ever got hold of this. C common sense is rendered as Gemeine mentioned Verstand, you know, like a common criminal. And, uh, the, it, maybe Kant did read this because he, in castigating Reed, Oswald, and Beatty, as if, as if what they came up with would serve as a criticism of Hume's sophisticated philosophy. He says, what does the common sense school do other than consult, quote, the wisdom of the herd? But you see, the common sense school is not, cons is not consulting the wisdom of the herd. It's not what everyone stands up and applauds. It's not what everyone claims for himself. It's what every one of us is under an obligation to take for granted. You can't prove the law of contradiction, for example, 
because all proof presupposes the validity of the law. You, you get that, right? Well, this is exactly what Reed is going to do with principles of common sense. Every mode of verification that you would seek to employ in an attempt to vindicate these principles presupposes their validity. And this gets very close to a Kantian transcendental argument, the necessary condition for something else to be the case. There's one more uh, feature of the critique that, um, that, that I want to bring to your attention before going into the details of what he means by uh, a transcendental argument. Kant very often takes recourse to legal metaphors. Uh, he speaks of the fair-minded judge. He speaks of the kind of evidence that would prevail upon the judgment of a good jury. He wants his arguments to be understood not as arguments in formal logic, but arguments in a, a transcendental logic, by which he means an evidentiary form of argument, given the fact what, get, given this is the case, what are the necessary conditions absent which this couldn't possibly be the case? Now we do know that Kant early on, I mentioned to you at the beginning of lecture, that his interests reached law and politics and so forth. Kant was quite interested in, in legal cases involving boundary disputes. And at law these are often referred to, the, the papers that would be filed in behalf of a boundary dispute would be re, re, referred to as deduction schriften, deduction schriften. And to some extent, Kant's own argument is a species of deduction schriften, where you show the, the pedigree of property claims, the pedigree of cognitive claims, how far back you can date them, what, what conditions they satisfy, what is made possible by the fact that they are in place. And I think you would be well served reading the first critique as if it were something of a brief. A, uh, something of a legal brief and uh, in place of something of a brief coupled with an oral an oral argument well is he just another dead uh, Prussian philosopher um, this is what we find in a contemporary a journal, a leading journal in, in physics. Quote, in physics it became quite clear in the last 30 years how the cognition of objects can be carried through. Surprisingly, the strategy which is applied in physics for the cognition of objects follows essentially the conceptual program formulated by Kant, even if the majority of physicists is not aware of this point. So I say this is not, not only did, in my judgment, Jonathan Bennett misidentify the body. Not only is the body not dead, but in some fields the body is, is very, much, very much alive. Um, what shall we say then about, about the overall aim? Well, I'm going to give you a puff now. I mean, this is almost a con, con should split the royalties with me. But I, I do want to say this much. First, contrary to a rumor that got started here four or five years ago, I am not a Kantian. <laughs> uh, um, I died in 322 BC with my friend uh, Aristotle and I think the whole damn thing's been downhill ever since. But, um, but could there possibly be a more consequential philosophical project. A project that respects the perceptual and cognitive resources that we bring to bear on every knowledge claim we make and at the same time does not lapse into a kind of psychology. A metaphysical analysis that I say respects the stamp of human cognition on all of its works, but does not lapse into subjectivity. A metaphysical project 
that would inform the sciences of just what it is that makes some of their undertakings necessarily successful in virtue of the manner in which we do cognize reality. Now, I'm going to leave you with a bee in the garden so that you understand that it is possible to maintain objectivity while respecting the perceptual uniqueness of the percipient. When I go into our garden at home in the right season, I admire yellow roses. We have yellow roses in the garden and they bloom beautifully. I don't do this alone because there's invariably a honeybee admiring or doing something with the same rose. As it happens, the peak spectral sensitivity of the normal human visual system is at 5500 angstroms, 550 millimicrons. You will call that yellow. The peak sensitivity in the visual system of the honeybee is in the ultraviolet. So the honeybee doesn't see anything yellow and I don't see anything ultraviolet. Are we both victims of some sort of hallucination? No. And once we start wading through Kant's arguments we will see the manner in which the unique perceptual and cognitive principles we bring to bear on the situation can preserve the objectivity of the knowledge we claim about that situation even while granting that what we are bringing to bear is distinctly human. Capito? Well then I shall see you in a week. Well, I say very early in the first critique and, and several times thereafter, Kant is reminding the reader that the project is to raise, if possible, is to raise metaphysics to the level of a science as one would understand science at the close of the 18th century, namely a systematic body of principles on which you can ground truths that are at once universal and necessary. So the question is whether whether this can be pulled off and, it, and if so what assumptions must, must be made. But he wants to make clear what, what gets us to be metaphysicians in the first instance. And I think in the back of his mind this is just another reminder of how people like Hume get themselves and the rest of us in trouble. What gets us to be metaphysicians in the first instance is that as ordinary percipients going through a life of ordinary events and having the most ordinary sorts of experiences we begin to ask questions about the source of the experience, the nature of the experience, what it is about our experience that matches up or fails to match up with what others have, can we trust uh, our senses, what are we supposed to do about these illusory phenomena, etc, etc. And so reason begins to raise questions about the nature of experience itself. Before long you're steeped in conjectures and wild theories and, and unsupportable, untestable suppositions. You've now entered, he says, the arena of metaphysics, do you see? This is where these conflicts are played out. They're played out in the individual person and they're played out in whole schools of philosophy. Now since you are uh, learned Oxford scholars, you know where the very term metaphysics comes from. It comes from Aristotle, but it doesn't come from Aristotle having an idea of what metaphysics is. Well, of course he had an idea of what metaphysics is since he invented it. But um, it's in the work we call Aristotle's metaphysics that in book one he informs his students, now having addressed the major issues in the natural sciences, physis, we will take up fundamental questions regarding the nature of being as such. So what he's 
What he's going to be lecturing on now is something that comes after the treatise on Thesis. And when first century scholars started line, AD started lining up uh, Aristotle's work and imposing a chronology on them, this work, which came after the physics, was simply designated Metata Physica, after the physics. Now in the good old days, when we were all very serious about keeping things neat and tidy, we used to tell students that metaphysics had two interdependent branches what, that constituted metaphysics. One had to do with the question of real being, real existence, so that one ground of metaphysical inquiry was ontology. And there are fundamental ontological questions, and in fact Aristotle's metaphysics addresses questions of that sort. Are there really substances? Do they undergo change? If they undergo change, do they remain the substance they were, etc., etc.? But of course, to address a question like that, you have to have some mode of inquiry. And every mode of inquiry is subject to criticism. Every mode of inquiry has its limitations. And so in the process of addressing ontological questions, you also have to ask how adequate, how apt the mode of inquiry is that you're using to address the question. And that comes down to us as epistemology. And so metaphysics in the traditional sense was a combination of ontological and epistemological uh, uh, inquiry designed to answer fundamental questions about real existence and the nature of the relationships that obtain among really existing things. Sometimes Aristotle's metaphysics is collapsed into, uh, you can summarize his uh, position by saying that the number of things we can know is determined by the number of questions we can ask, of which minimally anyway there are four. Does a thing exist? If it exists, in what degree does it exist? In what relation does it stand to other things? And what is it for? What is it for? The teleological part of explanation. So Kant is coming along centuries later. He's respectful of Aristotle, but he wants to notice that although mathematics and science have come a long way since Aristotle's time, this business of metaphysics doesn't seem to have moved an inch. And the question is why and what might be done to move the ball further down the field. Will we ever get out of the arena of contests in which one set of conjectures and speculations does battle with another set? Meanwhile, what has the world of high thought and science had to say about all this? And Kant laments the fact that because metaphysics has gone nowhere, the, the persons most interested in objective science have adopted what Kant calls indifferentism. It's sort of a pox on all these metaphysical houses. Why bother with it? We've got Newton, we've got Galileo, we've got Torricelli. We're doing just fine. Let the philosophers drive themselves crazy. And Kant understands and correctly understands that that is not a permissible option. Science cannot be indifferent as to its most fundamental grounding. It cannot be indifferent to the question of what presuppositions make it possible in the first instance. So the metaphysician's task is to restore metaphysics to a state of respectability, lest scientists and mathematicians become complacent and thus uh, court error. Now, what isn't on offer? Well, what is not on offer is the evidence of sense as a way of settling these questions. If you take a systematic science to be something that is parasitic on core universal principles, necessarily true, that is foundational for anything one erects on it, the evidence of sense is uniquely inapt. It's shifting, it's subject to error. The most you can claim for it is a kind of contingent factual truth.
truthfulness, but certainly nothing universal. So what Kant wants to make clear is that the nature of this metaphysical inquiry is into those pure aspects of the understanding. And when Kant says pure, he always means non-empirical. Reinen Vernunft, pure reason, is reason stripped of all empirical supports, attributes, and content. Pure. Now, in the preface to the second edition, we find him scolding anthropologists and what today we'd call sociologists and GADs, psychologists, who, who think that you can settle some of these disputes by looking at the peculiarities of the human condition or certain cultural forms of thought, etc. This is quite alive and well today, of course. And Kant says, metaphysics doesn't have anything to do with that at all. So in a word, you can underline this in your notes, Kant's metaphysics is not psychology. All right, it's not psychology. And therefore, it is not neuropsychology. It's not neurophysiology. It's not brain mechanisms. Just put all that away. Nothing about brain function is universal and necessary, and therefore it won't do the job. If you're looking for the center for the categorical imperative, you're working the wrong side of the street. I should tell you, there are people who are looking for the brain centers associated with the, I don't know, the categorical imperative. Um, I won't mention names because they're well known and some of them are friends of mine, but um, Back in 2001, I was giving a term of lectures at Princeton and was asked to comment on work going on to identify the central nervous system locus of moral decision making. I thought the whole thing was quite daft and politely said so when two months later, I think it showed up on the cover of Newsweek or something with a little bright dot the fMRI showing just the place in the brain that makes moral decisions. <laughs> My Lord. Uh, now, on the necessary and the universal, as you might guess, Aristotle is the one who put the ball in play, and he put the ball in play with formal logic. Formal logic, Aristotelian logic, syllogistic reasoning, etc., constitute the very rules of thought that apply to all of our deliberations, whether pure or empirical. These are truth-saving or truth-preserving logical devices. They are not modes of discovery. So although they constitute the formal rules of thought itself, they are, they, they are not intended and cannot reveal the factual nature of the external world. So something in addition to that is going to be required. So what Aristotle offers then by way of the syllogism, Kant is going to give a, is going to establish a nomenclature for him. This is where he makes the Kantian distinction between propositions that are analytic and propositions that are synthetic. Analytic propositions are universally and necessarily true, but they're true because tautologous. In an analytic proposition, Kant says, the meaning of the subject term is contained in the meaning of the predicate term, as in all bachelors are unmarried men. Of course, it's true that all bachelors are unmarried men, but it's a definitional truth. It's not that you found out something new, either about bachelors or about unmarried men, by learning that all bachelors are unmarried men. So it's in the nature of an analytic proposition that the truth it preserves can be known a priori. You, you don't have to run around asking persons you know to be bachelors, are you married, do you see? If you're doing that, you don't understand the language. So it's not something gained by way of empirical inquiry. It's something established by the very terms of the proposition. So 
analytic propositions are universal and universally and necessarily true, and their truth is known a priori, before experience, independently of experience. What about the facts of the world? The facts of the world are contained in what Kant refers to as synthetic propositions. It's another one of those terms you wish had been translated in some other way. But synthetic in the sense of pulling together the attributes and properties of things such that you know what the thing is. It's perfectly all right. Oxford lectures, we come and go as we please, actually. So, a synthetic proposition. This contains both metal and glass. This is capable of holding a fluid. This is blue. Now, these synthetic propositions involve the pulling together of sensory data in such a way as to identify something. The typical claim is that the truth of synthetic propositions can only be established, only established by experience. So the truth of any synthetic proposition is established a posteriori. In a nutshell then, Hume's claim, since Hume is always going to be in the background when he's not in the foreground, Hume's claim is that the truth of no synthetic proposition can be established a priori. Which is just another way of saying reason cannot unearth the facts of the world by way of its own resources, do you see? The rationalist project simply fails. If you want to establish the truth of a synthetic proposition, that's going to be based on experience. And here's the bad news. As it is based on experience, what you come up with will be contingent, probabilistic, to some extent subject to the errors to which the senses are prone. It's going to be specific to a particular species, perhaps under special circumstances, maybe dependent on the age of the observer, etc., 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 so that we return to the scandal Kant refers to in the prolegomena you can't establish the reality of an external world. You, you, you can't have a slam dunk once and for all proof of anything that comes under the heading of a synthetic proposition. Anything might be the cause of anything. So if in, a, a, in something short of an, a paragraph, a sentence, you wanted to boil down the contest between Kant and Hume, Kant is claiming that the truth of no synthetic proposition can be established a priori, and Kant is claiming that if we can establish the truth of any synthetic, even one synthetic proposition a priori, that's his answer to Hume. So that's going to be a central part of, uh, of, the, of the first critique. Now, there are already, Kant says, uh, any number of synthetic a priori truths that are known. In fact, mathematics and the physical sciences are riddled with them. Shall I give you a <coughs> synthetic proposition known to be true a priori in mathematics? There's no number so large that one cannot be added to it. Now that's, a, that's, that's true. If you're doing this, you say, Jean Piaget describes the radical empiricist as one who believes the series of positive integers was discovered one at a time. See? So if I tell you that there's no number so large that one cannot be added to it, and you find yourself running out of fingers and toes, you're very, very young. You're much younger than you are. That's a synthetic proposition known to be true. What about in the sciences? Can anyone think of a synthetic, think like Kant now, think Kant who thinks the first critique. Can you think of a synthetic proposition known to be true in the developed sciences that would be true across all developed sciences? 
Yes. Yes, or more, or more generally, every effect has a cause. Yeah, every effect has an antecedent cause. If you want to put it in the form of something Granny might have said, nothing will come of nothing. Well, that wasn't Granny, that was, that was Bill Shakespeare, wasn't it? So there's no line so long that you can't increase its length, etc. And now the question is going to be whether metaphysics itself can be, can be shown to be based on similar synthetic propositions, the truth of which is necessary and universal and known to be, known to be the case. That's one other way of putting the project itself. Kant was not the only one who was impatient with the state of metaphysics at the time. In fact, the Prussian Academy of Sciences had a prize competition in 1762. And if you wanted to enter, this was the question you had to address to win the prize. Listen carefully now. This would still be quite a good question. Quote, whether metaphysical truths in general, and especially the first principles of natural theology and morals, are capable of the same degree of proof as geometrical truths, and if they are not capable of such proof, what is the nature of their certainty, and to what degree can they achieve it, and is such certainty sufficient for conviction? Can metaphysics give us a totally credible account of the claims of religion, for example? How about the insistent demands of morality? Is it merely a matter of taste? Is it merely cultural? Could we find some place that, you know, non-vegetarian and they like to eat their young and that happens to be their preference? Or is there some way of establishing metaphysically that there are core moral precepts, the truth of which is necessary and universal if, and then you'd have to fill in the if with a certain kind of life as possible, etc., etc., etc. So there's the prize competition, and Kant entered it. Immanuel Kant enters the prize competition of 1762 and finishes second. Who won? Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn won, in part because he cheated. He actually answered the question head on. Kant was doing some other things. But uh, isn't it somewhat gratifying to know that, in a manner of speaking, Kant got a second? Um, no. What's recorded by the competition itself is the Prussian academies, and that is to say, indeed, the, the Prussian aristocracy, the Prussian king, already worried about the relativizing trends now taking place in the Anglo-European world. Remember now, this is the 1760s. The French philosophes are having a heyday against all traditional forms of authority. This is 1762 and 1765. Voltaire publishes a kind of ridiculing play on the claims of Leibniz. What's the name of the play? Candide. Candide. And who is the learned Leibnizian in Candide? Dr. Pangloss. And Pangloss has established without doubt, he's established to a moral certainty in virtue of his rational calculus that this is the best of all possible worlds. Now, it's part of Leibniz's rational philosophy that, yes, there is a distinction to be made between matters of fact and the truths of reason. 
But Leibniz argues that in the end, if we really had fully developed knowledge, we would understand that all propositions, including all factual propositions, are analytic. That is, everything is what it is because necessarily it must be. And if you follow that throughout the arc of the argument, then of course one of the conclusions, almost trivially true, is that this indeed is the best of all possible worlds. Any questions? So, um, a musical was made out of Candide. The music was written by Leonard Bernstein. And the book was written by Richard Wilbur, the poet, and Dorothy Parker, whose uh, moral instruction we all should follow. Quote, do whatever you like, but don't frighten the horses, close quote. And um, uh, Pangloss has wonderful lines given to him by, by Dorothy Parker and Richard Wilbur. And at the very end of the play, um, one of the characters just looks at the audience and says, any questions? So. Kant was very much influenced by Christian Wolff. In fact, Kant went so far as to say that this is Kant on Christian Wolff. Quote, he was peculiarly well fitted to raise metaphysics to the dignity of a science if only it had occurred to him to prepare the ground beforehand by a critique of the organ, that is, of pure reason itself. He finds in Wolf this important insight. The insight is that uh, we are not passive observers of the external world. We bring a certain assortment of cognitive and perceptual powers themselves governed by principles to bear on every factual claim we make and thus it's only by developing our understanding of our own mental apparatus now he didn't go so far as to say a thorough and critical appraisal of reason itself but a development of our own mental apparatus so that we can see what it is we're adding to what we take to be the truths of the external world. I say Wolf was, was important. He agitated for a scientific comprehension of the human mind and uh, a systematic study of cognition. He's also critical of empiricistic alternatives. Every time I say empiricistic alternatives, I always think Locke Barclay, Hume, Locke, Barclay, Hume. Not, not that there aren't others, but these are the figures with whom Kant is going to wrestle most uh, vigorously. Um, Wolf was a Leibnizian. In fact, uh, in fact, much of Leibniz's fame was posthumous. And much of the attention paid to Leibniz's teaching came as a result of the influence Christian Wolf had and the recognition that Wolff was providing distillations and uh, supporting essays on Leibnizian philosophy and Leibnizian theology. Um, in one of his most celebrated works, The German Metaphysics, Wolff says, because of that which one knows only by experience, one knows only that it is but doesn't see how it's connected to other truths. This will be a persistent complaint of the rationalist. What do you end up with Bacon when you have Baconian science? You end up with a thick and thickening book of observations. But there's nothing there to pull it together. Remember, how is nature possible? How, 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 how do all of these facts, these disparate facts, these merely contingent facts, finally becomes subsumed under something that is systematic, universal, and principled. And the argument against empiricism is that it has no means of doing that. It has a kind of mechanical associationism. 
And my goodness, what sort of a systematic world do you get with that? Even Hume says, with that, anything could be the cause of anything. So on the rational side, the rationalist side, what one is trying to do is render experience intelligible. And on the empiricist side, there is the complaint that every attempt at rendering experience intelligible is going to be based on precepts and principles that cannot be rationally grounded, cannot be rationally validated, you see. So Wolf is clear that empiricism has no means beyond associationism by which the elementary sensations or elementary ideas could possibly comprehend the natural world as, as given. Now, um, Locke's essay concerning the human understanding was, was read by Leibniz, and Leibniz prepared a book-length reply to it because he wanted to engage Locke directly in a productive philosophical controversy. And then Locke did something entirely unfair. Do, do you know what he did? He died. So here's Leibniz, hell-bent on having a good, robust sort of cafe metaphysics argument with the great British empiricist, and lo and behold, Locke goes ahead and dies on him. So Leibniz sat on the work for quite some time, and it, it, it finally was published, and it was published under the title New Essays on the Understanding. In that work, he attributes to Locke uh, a, a, a maxim which you'll find nowhere in Locke. It, it's probably a fair attribution, but it's a scholastic uh, maxim, which I say is not anywhere to be found in Locke's essay. Nihil est in intellectu quod non fuerit erat in sensu. Nothing is in the intellect which was not first in the senses. Nothing is in the mind except by way of the senses. Remember in in Locke's essay concerning the human understanding, he says, how comes the mind to be furnished? I answer in a word from experience. So, nihil est in intellectu, nothing is in the intellect, quod prius, which first is not, was not in the senses. Leibniz's reply to this could actually have been boiled down to two words, three words. Nisi intellectus ipsa. Nothing but the intellect itself. So, here are the terms of the dispute. On Leibniz's side, there must be an active organizing mind. There must be some set of organizing principles and precepts such that experiences don't simply become a bag of happenings. Rather, they become a coherent whole. They cohere. They render the world intelligible, not merely sensible, but intelligible. Well, how much of this prefigures the critique of pure reason? A good deal of it prefigures what Kant is, is going to be arguing for. Namely, precisely what is in, so to speak, the intellect that is responsible for the integration and synthesis and the rendering intelligible of the evidence of sense. Now, um, there can be no synthetic proposition whose truth can be established a priori. And Kant takes a look at what Hume is claiming in the inquiry. Remember, Kant did not have Hume's treatise of 1739. He had the inquiry of 1751, which was translated into German. The treatise was also translated, but not in time for Kant. <coughs> so here's David Hume, who tells us that he sees on the billiard table before him uh, a ball moving 
striking another ball which then moves, quote, and I must own I cannot see some third term betwixt them. So what Hume can't see, what Hume has no empirical evidence of, is causality. It's not on the billiard table. So where is it? Well, it must be in Hume. It must be some habit of the mind. Similarly, in the domain of morals, Hume has us examining this poor figure. You see, the victim of maybe highway robbery, sp sprawled out on the ground, pockets emptied, in a pool of blood perhaps. I could make this as gory as you like after lunch. And Hume summons us to find anything in that empirical fact, anything in the picture that is morally wrong. So where is the moral wrongfulness? It's not out there. It's in here. Or perhaps more aptly, in here. It has to be something that excites in us a feeling of revulsion. Do, where do you feel revulsion? I generally feel revulsion uh, right about here, I would say. Sometimes I call it heartburn. It comes if I watch the news. Feelings of revulsion or feelings of happiness. That is to say, the moral ascriptions that, that we make are reflections of how events in the external world affect us affectively, emotionally, sentimentally. He's one of the great figures in the British sentimentalist tradition of moral thought. So again, causality is a habit of the mind based on constant conjunctions. Morality is a set of sympathetic responses to events. Where does this put the physical sciences? Where does it put all the sciences? What does it do to the very notion of objectivity and our, and, and our comprehension of the objective facts of the external world, which after all is the part of the world of knowledge that Kant's first critique is seeking to save from skepticism. Now, I don't want to be guilty of a libel. I don't want to say, though it's absolutely true, and truth is a defense in a libel action. I suspect that more than half of this throng is quite at home with Hume on morals. I mean, I'd be very surprised. Do surprise me, though if you were prepared to take the position that moral precepts are absolute and universal, that the adequacy of a moral theory is entirely independent of the psychological, social, and cultural dimensions of the lives of those who subscribe to the theory, that there are moral truths that are true across all time, etc., etc. That's a pretty old-fashioned way of viewing things. Didn't Hume get it right that, after all, what we mean by morals is just a set of largely sentimental dispositions. We then do a kind of rational gloss on our own feelings, and we might come up with some quasi-utilitarian account that not only does it make me sick to my stomach, but it's, you know, ba bad for the stock market, that sort of thing. You do realize that if you attach yourself to a view like that, you, you are prey to a, a, a quite interesting criticism that was advanced, that can be found in Kant, and was advanced actually by G.E. Moore, of all people, a century ago. Here's the problem with the view. I'll try to do this right if I can. Now, I know what gives rise in me to feelings of revulsion. All right? Split infinitives, for example. The improper use of the gerund. All sorts of things. The older I get, the more things come under that heading. Most of them grammatical. But I don't quite know what gives rise in you to feelings of revulsion. So 
let's say we go down the highways and byways of the world and we both see that body stretched out in a pool of blood, pockets emptied, and I go something like, ooh, and you go something like, ew. Now, I know my feeling of revulsion, but I have no way of knowing your feeling of revulsion. Now, we walk a little further and there's another body and it's even in worse shape and then I go ooh ooh and you go ooh ooh and you look at me and say that's more revolting to me than the first one was and I say well it's more revolting to me too but as I don't know the magnitude of your revulsion and you don't know the magnitude of my revulsion we can't have a moral argument so there's something counterintuitive about a theory of morals that precludes serious moral disputes. How do you argue with people regarding their toothaches? Well, you say it's a terrible toothache, and I say I doubt it very much. That's not grounds for it. You said to your dentist, I've got a toothache, and he says, oh, come on. You change dentists, you say. So there, there is that counterintuitive consequence. There are answers to all these things. We're, we're philosophers, so there's an answer to everything. Um, the, the problem is then there's an answer to the answer, you know, and it, it, it goes on. And we engage in what Kant referred to as harumtappen, kind of blind groping that seems to be getting somewhere because our arguments get louder. Um, well, Hume sees billiard balls on a table before him. But you understand that space is also not given as a stimulus. He sees one ball move and then another ball moves. And you understand that time is also not given in the stimulus array. There are no sense organs for time. There are no sense organs for space. We've already seen the, the dispute regarding space. Leibniz has a reasonably good argument that concludes with there's no such thing as absolute space. There's no such thing as absolute space because there is no, call it a cause, call it a sufficient reason. There's no cause of nothing and if by absolute space you mean something entirely empty, something entirely empty is a nothingness and you can't cause nothingness. So I, I say on one account, space itself is problematical. But whatever you might want to say in behalf of Newtonian space, you certainly can't say that there's a sense organ that responds to it. So where is Hume going to get a billiard table out there with one thing moving and then another thing moving. So we already begin to see what Kant's ploy is going to be. Kant's ploy, his, his, the, the gambit goes something like this. You accept Hume's conclusions but you show that there are presuppositions necessary for those conclusions to be defensible and the presuppositions turn out to be at variance with the Humean position in the first instance. What is it that must be the case for there to be temporally successive events? What must be the case for anything to happen in space? And so one might want to argue, as I shall be arguing next week, that on Kant's account the success of Hume's program presupposes the adequacy of Kant's metaphysics and particularly the adequacy of Kant on the pure intuitions of time and space. Now, I did say something about, about, uh, about Fichte and um, I, I was, of course, joking before class with think him who thinks the wall. But I do want to say something about Kant interpretation because we're now getting to the point in these lectures where interpretation is required. 
The interpretation that I shall be offering in the balance of these lectures is, shall we say, sympathetic, but not fawning. And sympathetic in this sense, Kant is one of the great philosophical minds in the history of philosophical reflection. It gets tiresome to see the volume of books and articles so self-contented in establishing how silly Kant was to claim X or Y, how wide of the mark he was with a particular argument, how absolutely uh, uh, self-contradictory he is from page this to that. But you, you get a, a picture of Kant very much like the picture philosophers of mind give you of Descartes, that he was some ninny who attached himself to some theory or thesis, some theater of the mind, some homuncular theory according to which we've got to have someone inside looking at what we're looking at in order for us to see it, that, that, that any first year philosophy student can do much better at. Silly Descartes, for goodness sake, he makes mistakes that 15 year olds would find laughable. I want you to disabuse yourself of that convenience. Descartes was not the class clown. And Kant did not go through two editions of perhaps the greatest metaphysical treatise ever composed while proving how wonderful he was at missing the point and contradicting himself. So what I'm going to presuppose in the lectures is where the, where the text is problematical, there's a stylistic problem, a translation problem, and to some extent perhaps a problem of comprehension. You want to begin with the assumption that if you don't get what Kant's saying, it could be that you're not getting it. Not, not necessarily that he isn't saying it. So that's what I mean when I say that the lectures will be sympathetic. I, I will always try to think the Kant who was thinking the first critique. And there's a secondary literature out there that you could build a house with, a very large house with, that will make clear to you how routinely Kant gets almost everything wrong. I began these lectures with Jonathan Bennett declaring the body of Kant's thought to be dead and gone, and the only remaining task is to see if you could find some semblance of life amidst the litter. Yeah, sure. See you in a week. Does a dog see a tree? You know, it's, it's an interesting question, isn't it? There's, there's no doubt with it. By the way, just speaking personally, I have no doubt but that dogs see trees, and indeed even that they leave a record of their perception behind them very often. But to see a tree is quite different from just seeing something. It's quite different from just seeing. A tree, any given tree, is a particular. But to see something as a tree is to subsume that particular under a general category. And after all, particular trees come in a great variety of sizes and shapes and colors. And so, in order to see a tree, as in seeing a tree, it seems that what is needed in addition to some capacity for sensation, also a capacity for subsuming sensed objects under categories in such a way as to have a concept, you see. And during the course of this lecture I want to emphasize how Kant himself emphasizes the need for the perceived object to be incorporated into a conceptual framework, absent which there is no understanding of what the object is, and in fact, and in fact there really isn't an experience either. There's going to be a, an important distinction made between a perception, no question at all, but the dogs and lots of other creatures perceive trees, and the experience of seeing a tree. And Kant is going to argue that a necessary ingredient in experience is just this subsumption of percepts under general categories, forming, forming concepts. 
Now, this is one of uh, many problems that Kant recognizes empiricism, at least in its simplest form, will always have trouble handling. If you take the position that all that is required to form concepts is to be the passive observer of events taking place in the external world and put on hold how there is an external world to begin with, an external world to begin with. But if you take the position that all that's required to form complex ideas is to parlay simple ideas, and all it takes to get simple ideas is to associate a number of, of sensations, if you take that that Lockean, what, what Kant refers to as Locke's attempt to physiologize the process, then it's not entirely clear that, that a creature would live long enough to be able to put under the same category gigantic trees in a redwood forest and little saplings that are six inches off the ground, or that any child would understand, ever come to understand, that tabby and mountain lions are cats more generally that any set of particulars can enter into a conceptual framework such that one actually understands what one is looking at and one is not merely looking at it. More than this is required. In, in first lecture I talked about this shower of stimulation, this incessant barrage of physical events impinging on sense organs out of which we have to create some orderly world, some lawful world, out of which we create, in Kant's terms, nature itself. Imagine everyone in the room had a different word, that if somehow you could put all of the words on all of the cards together, you would have the, the let's say, the menu at the Randolph or something. Right. How do, these, how do these words get put together? How do we put together this, this storm of sensations in such a way as to make this? After all, the manifold of stimuli constitutive of this is diverse, it's changing. It changes as I change its direction and its orientation. It changes as you look sideways at it. It's constantly changing and it has many, many different properties. Somehow these have to be pulled together in the right way, just as the notes would have to be pulled together in the right way. Kant wants to argue that there's nothing in empiricism that tells us how this happens, do you see? So we're getting into the project now where he's actually going to attempt to explain things that he is satisfied empiricism cannot explain, which is to say the ordered nature of experience and our capacity to recognize things and place them in a conceptual framework that, surprise, surprise, is objective. All right. Promises, promises. So the critique is divided into, this is quite un uneven division, into a very long section which he titles The Transcendental Doctrine of the Elements, and a relatively short but quite decisive section on the Transcendental Doctrine of Method, which we will get to in later lectures. It's under that heading that we meet up with the paralogisms of pure reason, all of the ways that reason gets in trouble when it tries to range beyond the ambit of its proper mission and its powers. Well, what elements does Kant have in mind when he refers to the transcendental doctrine of the elements? The elements are the elements of cognition. One might say the elements that mind as such brings to bear on, on reality. And this is uh, further divided into three main sections. The transcendental aesthetic by which Kant attempts to establish the conditions necessary for sensibility itself, the a priori conditions absent which experience itself would be impossible, 
which is to say for there to be a visual experience something other than a retina with receptor cells and photopigments and a little dangling uh, uh, retinal ganglion cell tail forming an optic nerve but something more than that is necessary something must be in place for any of that finally to amount to a perception and what is it a priori that must be in place and then the transcendental analytic which establishes the a priori and necessary and universal conditions for there to be understanding itself and then reflections on the rules that govern the deployment of our rational resources in such a way as to render the outcome objective and not subjective necessary and universal and not relative iffy and conducive to skepticism Capito? It's all quite simple when you think about it. Ha ha ha. Now, how does Kant want the term transcendental to be understood? First, with Kant it is something of a neologism and he's using it quite deliberately to distinguish what he has in mind from the transcendent. The transcendent refers to that which transcends experience. It's beyond the ambit of our perceptual resources. It's what traditional rationalism says uh, is available to us as non-sensory modes of knowing. Kant says that's off limits. We don't do that because we can't do that. Forget looking for the transcendent as an element of knowledge. The transcendent can be reached by faith, by belief, by imagination, by hope, by coin flipping. Need I go on? But, but not as an element of knowledge because for there to be knowledge there must be a sensory basis. There must be an experiential basis on which any knowledge claim is based. So establish something as transcending the realm of experience and you have established that whatever it is you achieve it is not knowledge. So he wants to make a distinction now between this realm of the transcendent which is off limits epistemologically and what he refers to as transcendental conditions. Uh, it's at um, A708, B736. Where he tells us what he has in mind with the doctrine of methods, which we will get to, when he says it's the determination of all the formal conditions of a complete system of pure reason. So, so he is going to develop a, I hate the word, a methodology. He's going to develop a mode of argument and analysis that establishes when reason goes beyond its legitimate, its legitimate uh, grounds, its legitimate terrain. Um, now, with respect to the transcendental, he's helpful again in giving us a definition. I entitle transcendental, this is at A11, B25. I entitle transcendental all knowledge which is occupied not so much with objects as with the mode of our knowledge of objects insofar as this mode of knowledge is to be possible a priori. Transcendental refers to the enabling conditions, the conditions that render something possible, do you see? So a transcendental analysis is, a, is an analysis of some achievement of ours and the achievement is established. We see trees. And then the question is what must be in place a priori and necessarily for us to have the concept of a tree, for us to be able to subsume a particular tree under that general concept. Now that would be a transcendental 
analysis. And the conditions necessary for that would be transcendental conditions. So the term refers to the conditions or powers that render something possible, the a priori conditions that are enabling. They don't come about as a result of experience, but are understood to be necessary for there to be experience. You might recall from last week that very breathless Kant's answer to Hume, which when we get today to the second analogy I'll spend some more time on. But if, Q, if Hume wants a billiard table in front of him, and if he wants balls moving, that is to say if he wants events separated in time and understood to be somewhere out there, he's got to reconcile those claims to the fact that there are no sense organs for out there, there is no sense organ for elapsed time, so where does this spatio-temporal domain come from? And it's going to be Kant's argument in the transcendental aesthetic, that it comes from us. That in fact our very mode of engaging the external world is spatio-temporal. And that's what the transcendental aesthetic is, is all about. The necessary conditions for there to be an out there. Now, why must this be the case a priori? And you know what you're tempted to do. You're tempted to take the position of the ordinary percipient and maybe in a huff or with characteristic youthful impatience. What did that old Greek say in the rhetoric? Young men have strong passions which they tend to gratify indiscriminately. They love too much and hate too much and in all things do things to excess. Well, in that youthful impetuosity, you might be inclined to say, out there, for goodness sake, and use some sort of hand movement to dismiss the metaphysical question of how anything comes to be out there. Well, enter that Cartesian realm for a moment. Suppose you want to accept the proposition that the only thing you have direct access to are your own experiences, the contents of your own consciousness. How on earth could you ever reach the conclusion from events to which you have direct access now in consciousness that there's something out there bringing those events about? That is, what would be the sensory cue by which you understood that some things of which you are conscious are out there and other things aren't. Here's the answer to the Kantian answer to the question. You couldn't do it. This is why he tells us at the outset that one of the embarrassments of metaphysics is that philosophy still cannot establish the reality of an external world. Do you see, if you accept as an argument an empiricist thesis according to which all of your knowledge is mediated by sensory perceptual resources so that the only thing to which you have access are the contents of your own mind, then how could you ever have a warrant for concluding that in addition to the contents of your own mind, there's an external world bringing them about? Hello, solipsism, you see. And there are various counters to it. There are sort of, Kant was quite impatient with the impatient common sense alternative that says, oh, for goodness sake, we just know it, get on with it. Um, the one thing Kant never does is get on with it. Um, so, so against the empiricists, Kant rejects a theory that would have our understanding of the external world constructed out of elementary sensations and that somehow time and space go get 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 what imported into our consciousness by way of these external events can't be the case he says it just isn't the case um, so so we have to bring a spatio-temporal framework we carry a spatio-temporal framework a priori as the in place conditions of sensibility. 
We have a capacity, he says, which most fundamentally can be called the capacity of receptivity. We, we've got an apparatus that at least is capable of being stimulated. That isn't going to get us very far. Somehow that pattern of stimulation has to become coherent. It has to be packaged. And the packaging is spatiotemporal. Not by way of experience, but the necessary precondition for experience. Therefore what? Non-empirical, therefore pure. The pure intuitions of time and space. The pure intuitions. Why on earth we chose to translate Anschauung, intuition, to the uh, eternal frustration of students first encountering Kant. The German, is, well, uh, let, let me not become a philologist. If you're a native German speaker and you're talking to another native German speaker about, about a, some cosmic issue, you, you want to know that person's world view, do you see? How they consider the world. You might say over the fourth cup of coffee in a smoke-filled room, was ist deine Weltanschauung? What is your world view? Weltanschauung. From Anschauung, which is to show or to observe something. Anschauungen are intuitions but I would have you understand Anschauung intuition as a mode of apprehension. A mode of what? A, a mode of beholding the external world. Do you see? In the older German, Anschauung, the verb is to behold. And when I behold upon a night starred face, in German it would be anschauen, you see. No one would say, and when I intuit upon a night's starred face, huge cloudy symbols of a high romance. Can you imagine any poet saying, and when I intuit upon a night's star... Well, God, poets don't do much philosophy. So, so the pure intuitions of time and space then, become the non-empirical, necessary, universal framework that goes with every beholding we have of the sensible world. Every apprehension we have of something out there. And in fact, space is that pure intuition that is the necessary condition for, Kant says, outer sense, it is in virtue of it that I can distinguish, I can distinguish myself from the objects in the external world. There can be an I-thou relationship or an I-it relationship in virtue of the pure intuition of space. And it is the pure intuition of time that is the framework for inner sense. My thoughts succeed each other. That is to say, they are ordered in time. My feelings are ordered in time. That's something I can now project onto the external world, thereby gaining what? Succession, do you say? So now um, Hume's billiard balls can move in sequence. First one, then the other. They are successive in experience in virtue of the fact that the pure intuition of time temporally organizes my inner states. Now, of course, much more than this is required if there's to be bona fide knowledge. Kant identifies two fundamental powers of the mind from which knowledge itself arises. I quote Kant at A50, B74. The first is the capacity of receiving representations. 
The second is the power of knowing an object through these representations. So again, this distinction now between a capacity of receptivity and a quite different capacity for, given we've received it, knowing it. As I say, experience is not merely a bare sensation. Knowledge arises when experience and the pure concepts of the understanding are properly merged, do you see? That is to say, the, experience, the experiences have to be subsumed properly under the, under, the right, under the right categories. This second power is the one Kant dubs spontaneity. The power of spontaneity. It is the freedom with which this power operates that permits conceiving of that which is even impossible or extending concepts beyond the range of possible experience. For example, his example at A96, the concept of God. Kant summarizes the process this way. This is a worthy quote. When, when he's clear, he can be quite clear, by the way. This is at A97. If each representation were completely foreign to every other, standing apart and in isolation, that's that shower of events that are not coherently related. If each representation were completely foreign to every other, standing apart and in isolation, no such thing as knowledge would ever arise. For knowledge is essentially a whole in which representations stand compared and connected. Receptivity can make knowledge possible only when combined with spontaneity. So these things have to be pulled together in the right way. All right now, what is the source of this spontaneity? If you don't hear the echo, the bat squeak, the mm-hmm of that doughty Scotsman at Aberdeen, the source of spontaneity, says Kant, is mother wit. Mutter Witz. <laughs> if that isn't a principle of common sense, I don't know what is. Mother wit? This is the most intractable, the most Byzantine treatise in metaphysics in the, in the entire philosophical canon. And on this key and necessary power, by which representations are pulled together in just the right way, the power of spontaneity, the source of it is mother wit. Well, yes. Well, yes. Where else? You, not from experience. Do you know how long it would... Do you, I. I was kidding with you last week with Piaget's comment about the radical empiricist who believes the series of positive integers was discovered one at a time. Suppose you, 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 you try to construct a, a, a coherent, ordered, natural world with no resource other than repeated exposure to things, repeated exposure to things, and the formation of certain associative bonds. Oh, please! First of all, how could you associate your first encounter with this if your second encounter is this? Or this? Or this? Every one of these things would be another disconnected... Uh, uh, I shall give you the neurological answer. You won't live long enough. You won't live long enough. Maybe at 97 you'll say, it's a glass? Is it a glass? Is it a glass then? And then I'd say to you, is it breakable? What? <laughs> now Kant develops a defense of the intuitive a priority of time and space by way of what he refers to as a metaphysical exposition 
and a transcendental exposition. You might remember from first week that Kant's understanding of metaphysics is that it, it's the arena in which competing theories have it out. Uh, it, it's the incessant argument, it's the yes but, it's the sick et non, uh, it's lively um, and, and sometimes unruly. And, it, it, and that's why you end up with indifferentism on the part of the scientific community, skepticism on the part of the philosophical community, because these metaphysical disputes never seem to come to an end. So the prize competition, etc., etc. Well, Kant is going to engage in a metaphysical exposition, as I've done so far, to show that there really aren't any, there aren't experiential sources for time and space, that the empiricist project just won't do it. So that's the metaphysical exposition. The metaphysical exposition is to the effect that you cannot get here from there. The transcendental exposition, as in transcendental, now is the constructive part of the argument showing the necessary and universal conditions such that you do get from here to there. So you do get succession, you do get outer sense, you do get a valid and objective uh, representation of the external world, etc. Difference between the metaphysical exposition and the transcendental exposition. Now what about Leibniz and the rationalist tradition? After all, the, the debate that was the, the show stopper, actually, for um, uh, the, the, the early decades of the 18th century was the Newton-Leibniz controversy, which shows up in the, in the Clark-Leibniz correspondence. And central to that whole issue was space. As I noted in the first lecture and the second lecture briefly, with Newton's theory requiring absolute space as what? As that cosmic container into which uh, all material objects are located, and it's really there, there really is a cosmic container into which everything real has been poured. And Leibniz's position, by way of the law of sufficient reason, that the idea of space as an empty thing into which you might pour other things requires that space be, uh, that space as a nothing, space as empty, somehow comes about as a result of a reason for having nothing. And that's contradictory. So that debate is going back and, and forth. And Kant is going to take, he's, he's going to take sides on the science of the thing because he is, a new, he's, he is going to be Newtonian in his natural science. But he does understand that the issue of space is a problem and that you cannot get it by having Newton simply put it there. What he does have to make clear is that no device within the rationalist tradition can deduce answers to the question about the source of space. And he does this in a number of ways, but one of the very clever ways has to do with what today we call chiral objects. What is a chiral object? Yes? Sorry? Yes, handedness. That's right. Look, um, if you look at your right hand in a mirror, remember now, it's a mirror image. All of the internal relations that constitute this hand are fully preserved in the mirror image. But you cannot put a left glove on your right hand, you see. Th there's no contortion of a left-handed glove that will map it correctly onto your right hand. These are called chiral objects. There's good evidence that well, the concept of handedness itself. Suppose you, would, you had some means of contacting life in another galaxy. Let's say intelligent life. 
<laughs> which begs all sorts of questions, doesn't it? Um, and here's the question you, you, you sent to them. You sent them this message after you developed some means of communicating with them. We here, in a place called Earth, have hearts that are slightly displaced to the left. Are your hearts displaced to the left? You realize they'd have no, no way of answering that question. How do you get left and right? Now, on the Kantian scheme, since the mode of apprehension is itself spatial, it is in virtue of the fact that our experiences are spatially ordered and that gives us the means by which to let's say establish that if my palm is up and I'm facing north my thumb is facing east etc because I've already got the necessary spatial structuring built in but you realize in a universe that contained only one hand and let's say some intelligent being there's no way an intelligent being could determine whether that hand was left or right now that matter stood that way I wish we had more time that matter stood that way until I think it was 1958, thanks to Dr. Wu, when she, in the process of winning the Nobel Prize, uh, did some elaborate experiments in physics, establishing that God, those of you who are doing theology should know this, God is weakly left-handed uh, as regards the asymmetry of the cosmos. 1958 was the year I earned my bachelor's degree, a lifelong left-hander doing battle with a right-handed world, and when I discovered that God was at least weakly left-handed, I said, yes. Ah, sorry, I said, yes. <laughs> so, so uh, Kant is among the first, actually, to employ this concept of uh, of incongruity of parts, chirality, and to do so uh, in furtherance of the proposition that absent the pure intuition of space, we couldn't even make sense of things like that. The point being, no rational deductive procedure would, would tell anyone, follow this please, if all you gave the Leibnizian was this hand, and the Leibnizian was required by way of some sort of rational analysis, principle of sufficient reason, law of contradiction, to know that you can't put a left-hand glove on this hand, or, or, or that the mirror image of this hand nonetheless constitutes an incongruity of some sort. There isn't anything within the ambit of reason's powers that would get you to that. Do you see? So the empiricist can't account for it at all, and the rationalist might very well just go running down the street like Edvard Munch's scream. Um, now, the, the transcendental exposition is designed to show not only that space is a pure intuition, but that it must be. And for his principal example, he chooses geometry which he takes to be, as he says at B40, a science which determines the properties of space synthetically and yet a priori. He has this in his introduction, he has this praise of Thales. He says, oh, wh whoever it was, but tradition uh, gives us Thales. As uh, the first we know about, who, ap who constructed the isosceles triangle. Uh, look, take the Pythagorean theorem. You, you don't honestly think Pythagoras ran around measuring right angle triangles and came to the happy conclusion that there was a formula that you could use that turned out to be a version of a square plus b square equals c square. E even if he were lucky enough, in, with the first right angle triangle, that it be a 3-4-5 right angle triangle. 
the sheer math of of doing it for triangles that are that are odd numbered would would be beyond his resources. The geometry we have is something mathematicians constructed. Thales makes an isosceles triangle. He develops geometers will develop the axioms and theorems that provide a science of geometry which then in fact can be mapped onto the objective world. The way they do this is by having the capacity for spatial representations. It's not something about the external world that they go out and discover is Euclidean. It's that their own spatial mode of representation is itself and of necessity Euclidean and that's what they bring to bear in the construction of the science of geometry and that's what turns out to be, oh happy day, uh, something that lines up with the objective world, with the world as understood by science. So these are, these are arguments adduced in support of the not only the fact of the pure intuitions of time and space, but their necessity. And in fact, their ability to match up with the objective world. It's not an accident that they match up with an objective world, because our engagement of the objective world becomes possible by virtue of these very resources. It's what we bring to the situation. So no surprise when we recover, when we recover our own um, aesthetic and, and uh, cognitive uh, resources in our knowledge, in our knowledge base. Now finally there are the three analogies of experience that uh, are central to Kant's critique of traditional empiricism. He says at A180, B223, an analogy of experience will therefore be only a rule in accordance with which unity of experience is to arise from perceptions and not as perception itself. These are going to be rules. These are rules that determine how perceptual outcomes actually rise to the level of experience in a manner that is, not, that is not subjective, not relative, but necessitated by the, very, by the very absolute nature of the rules themselves. Um, I don't want to take too much time on this. I think Kant chooses the term analogy perhaps after Locke. You might want to consult Locke's essay, Book 4, Chapter 16, Section 12 where Locke says this, concerning the manner of operation in most parts of the works of nature, wherein though we see the sensible effects, yet their causes are unknown, and we perceive not the ways and manner how they are proceed, produced. Analogy in these matters is the only help we have, and it is from these analogies alone that we draw all of our grounds of probability. So, for example, the Newtonian world at the level of observation becomes explicable by way of something called a gravitational force that itself is not observable. But that idea of a force as something that pushes and pulls, it's analogizing to things that we do know about and as a way of establishing the cause of things where we cannot see the cause itself. Mind you, Newton never claimed, well he claimed once and then corrected himself, that gravity was the cause of uh, things. He said uh, uh, the gravitation laws are the rules by which the cause operates. We do not have access to the cause. Why anything released goes down is something he says we, we can't explain. That it goes down we, we know. Well Kant sets up the uh, the analogies uh, this way. The first analogy is that in all change of appearances substance is permanent. Its quantum in nature is neither increased nor diminished. Now you understand that uh, absent that there would be no means by which to establish 
that a something is undergoing alteration. All we would conclude is that it disappeared and was replaced by a different thing. So the first analogy of experience is, is that we experience certain entities as substances in that we recognize alterations in them as alterations in something that is itself permanent versus an utter change in things, an utter metamorphosis. The second analogy, which is a key part of the answer to Hume, everything that happens, that is, begins to be, presupposes something upon which it follows according to a rule. Or as Kant expressed it in the second edition, quote, all alterations take place in accordance with the law of connection of cause and effect. Again, um, What's Hume's theory of causality? What's his account of the concept of causality? Constant conjunction. When, quote, whenever two events are constantly conjoined in experience, it is in virtue of a habit of the mind that one comes to be regarded as the cause of the other, you see. Constant conjunction. Reed had a field day with that one. Reed says, this is a quote from Reed, no two events have been as constantly conjoined in human experience as day and night, and yet no man come of years regards day as the cause of night, or night the cause of day. Put another way, one doesn't have to keep shooting Jack before reaching the conclusion that you indeed are the cause of his dying. Generally one shot will do. Look, look, it, ju it just turns out that there is a fundamental... That, what did you learn in school? You learned in school that correlation does not imply causality. See? So constant conjunction simply misses the essential feature of our causal attributions. Not that A and B happen together, but that given A, you must get B. Now, that necessary relation is not something that Kant wants to argue is in some way empirically observable. It is in the nature of experience that that rule guides our perception of temporally associated events. Do you see? It's a feature. Because if you didn't have that, there really would be no grounds on which to establish causality. Now, um, the third analogy asserts that, quote, all substances, insofar as they can be perceived to coexist in space, are in thoroughgoing reciprocity. Kant's proof of this is as follows. I can look first at the moon and then the earth, or conversely, first at the earth and then the moon. Perception can must follow, perceptions can thus follow each other reciprocally. It's on this basis that they're said to be coexistent. Such coexistence is the existence of the manifold at one and the same time. Now, unless you had that as an a priori mode of experience, there'd be no way of distinguishing between sequences that are causal and sequences that are merely coexistent. I'd be saying something like, well, I'm going to look out the window now, now I'm going to look at you, and I'm looking out the window now, and now I'm going to look at you, and I've reached the conclusion that my looking out the window causes you. Unless there were an a priori means by which to establish coexistences over and against causal lawful relationships. That again is a transcendental argument, you see. You, you, you establish the conditions necessary for X to be the case, already having granted that X is the case. So what's necessary for it to be the case? I want to wrap this up with a, a remark that Kant makes in the prolegomena. This in the prolegomena at 2.59. Kant ties his entire project to what he takes to be David Hume's problem. For Hume, says Kant, quote, the question was not whether the concept of cause was right 
useful and even indispensable for a knowledge of nature, for this Hume had never doubted. But whether that concept could be thought by reason, a priori, and consequently whether it possessed an inner truth independent of all experience. Now I think there's serious Hume scholarship that, that, that might contest the claim that, that Hume actually was not skeptical about there being causes. Uh, for the little it's worth, my view is that Hume was not at all skeptical about there being causes, and nor was he trying to provide an account of causality. I believe Hume quite clearly was attempting to account for the concept of causality, and he accounts for that concept by way of a kind of mental associative machinery. Kant is saying that what Hume threw his hands up over was the inability of a purely rational analysis to establish causal lawfulness. Well, the second analogy is an answer to that question of Hume's. Experience is possible only through the representation and the necessary connection of perceptions. Absent the necessary connection among perceptions, experience is simply not possible. Thus, to the extent that empiricism would restrict knowledge to experience, it can succeed only by accepting the very grounding of experience itself, which is the grounding Kant provides in the second analogy. Thank you. Well, how are a priori synthetic judgments possible? In the Prolegomena, Kant says that pure mathematics, and especially Euclidean geometry, can have objective reality only on the condition that they refer to objects of sense. Now, what's particularly important in that brief passage is that Kant, again, as he often does, refers to the objectivity of mathematical and scientific propositions. This is over and against claims, their current claims and frequent claims, that Kant's metaphysics lapses into subjectivism. If it does, it does so over Kant's objections. But in the same passage, he declares that the propositions of geometry are, quote, necessarily valid. Why? Because space itself is nothing other than the form of all external appearances. So every time he, just about every time he asserts the objectivity of the program, he inserts something that does look like it's a road to subjectivity. And so the task is to determine just how we can get objective knowledge of the external world by means of a framework that we impose on the external world or put in the form of a question, how are synthetic propositions known to be true a priori? Well, here's an answer to the question. We might say Hume's answer to the question. They can't be. Now that would be the end of the story. In fact, most empiricists would argue that it is simply out of the question that the truth of a synthetic proposition could be established a priori. You know, back in the 1930s, C.D. Broad reflected on this. This is before uh, Quine and company. And he said that, uh, he said, those who insist on the impossibility of our being able to know the truth of synthetic propositions a priori are surely advancing a synthetic proposition and it seems to be one that they take to be self-evidently true so there, there is this problem if you want to declare once and for all that it is out of the question that there can be synthetic propositions the truth of which can be established a priori if you want to deny that are you denying it as itself a synthetic proposition and do you, and do you take that synthetic proposition to be self-evidently true i leave you with that in the preface to the second edition, Kant traces the development of systematic knowledge from Aristotle's logic to the mathematics and science of his own day, 
uh, with a lengthy pause over the achievements of Galileo and Newton in the preceding century. Aristotelian logic, he says, no surprise here, constitutes the formal laws of all thought, but it serves formal logic, Aristotle's logic, he says rather pictorially, it serves as, quote, the vestibule of the sciences. And while it is necessary to enable us to form a correct judgment with regard to the various branches of knowledge, still the acquisition of real substantive knowledge is to be sought only in the sciences properly so called. That is, and here's the claim again, the objective sciences. So you cannot use Aristotelian logic as a mode of discovery. You can use it as a truth preserving device. In fact, uh, eighth week when we get to the antinomies of pure reason, you'll see what happens when you attempt to use logical forms not merely as a method but as a mode of discovery. And of course you'll end up discovering all sorts of things, all of them, all of them illusory. So it is the objective sciences that are again the model here. Now why should anyone assume that the objective sciences are, are themselves able to capture the order of nature, the lawfulness of nature? Kant begins with the assumption that nature is an orderly enterprise, that it is law governed, do you see? Uh, on the strength of what does he say that? Well, on the strength of Newtonian science, the laws have, have been worked out. Well, from the fact that, that nature is lawful, and from the fact that we have uncovered the lawfulness of nature, we must have some means by which to overcome subjectivity and reach an objective knowledge of the way things are. So, so much for a skepticism about our capacity for unearthing the objective facts of nature. Now, uh, Kant is not taking a lead here. The lead is ancient. Aristotle says in the physics, if the art of shipbuilding were in the wood, we would have ships by nature. So it, it's been obvious for quite a long time that there are design features to the natural world. Am I allowed to say intelligent design features in the natural world? Uh, is Professor Dawkins listening? Maybe? Well, but if the art of shipbuilding were in the wood, we would you'd be able to leave driftwood out and if you let enough time go by and had enough cows die near the driftwood perhaps in infinite time you'd be able to fashion leather sails and something like a trireme with three rows for oarsmen and you might even be able to wage a naval battle on Egypt. Mind you this would take a great deal of time The very laws of the objective sciences show the sciences to have a rational character. Now that lawfulness is not given in the appearances. The stimulus that arrives at the organs of sense does not carry any information regarding lawfulness with it. If it's visual, it's just photons, do you see? If it's auditory, it's just air vibrations. So the lawfulness must be coming from some place other than the arriving wave of stimulation. Our scientific understandings in which lawfulness is the defining feature do find us relating to the objects of our understanding in one of two ways. Either by way of rational, a rational cognition that determines the concept of the object, th this is Kant in his most lumbering prose, and it's not easier in German. And if I illustrated it by giving it to you in German, most of you wouldn't get um, I should tell you about an, an incident involving one of our famous philosophers here, no, no longer here, known for this kind of prose. He, he gave a keynote address for the international philosophy meetings in Moscow some years ago, and this is where when you sit down you can adjust the dials to whatever language you speak and two minutes into his address people were fiddling with the dials trying to 
find a language that would render all this intelligible. I, 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 the, the same, the same might, might be said if you serve up a sentence like this, that our scientific understanding, in which lawfulness is the defining feature, finds us relating to the objects of this understanding in one of two ways. We relate to it in one of two ways. Either by way of a rational cognition that determines the concept, well, the Pythagorean theorem. This is a mode of cognition. Given the mode of cognition, we determine the concept of a right angle triangle. It's, it's not that Pythagoras ran around looking for these things. It's these things were constructed by Pythagoras. Or by way of rational cognitions that establish the very reality of an object. Saturn has moons. So these are the two ways that we can relate our cognition to an objective reality. Either the cognition actually determines the concept itself, quite characteristic of mathematics, or in the natural sciences, it's in some branches of the natural sciences, cognitively we actually can discover things that heretofore had not been known. The first form of the relationship between cognition and its objects is what Kant says is the grounding of all theoretical sciences, of which mathematics and physics are the two that are most developed. But they differ in this respect. In mathematics, all of the concepts are a priori. In physics, some of the concepts arise from other sources, such as direct observation. Now, what does he mean when he says that all of the concepts in mathematics are a priori? And I think it's fair to say contemporary mathematicians probably would not accept that. But absent the pure intuitions of time and space, Kant wants to argue, you could have neither arithmetic nor geometry. Because all arithmetic operations are sequential and sequentiality presupposes time and time is a pure intuition it's not something given in the stimulus so were it not for our spatio-temporal mode of apprehension we would be in a position for neither arithmetic operations nor geometric operations geometry presupposes just that spatial context that is provided by the pure intuition of space as arithmetic provi as, as uh, the pure intuition of time provides the means by which arithmetic sequential operations become possible. I'm not defending this, I'm attempting to clarify it. Uh, arithmetic requires the pure intuition of time because it depends on succession and geometry comparably depends on space. Now in this Kant pays homage to Thales. He thinks that one of them, he says Thales or, or whoever did this, uh, he thinks that it was in the ancient Greek world that someone, perhaps Thales, he names Thales because he's fixated on Thales and the isosceles triangle, actually came to the recognition that it was he, Thales, who was constructing out of his own conceptual resources that which then could be objectively applied to the world. That in fact there was an abstract representation of something that is objectively real and that it is out of the cognitive resources of the mathematician that this matching becomes possible. In demonstrating the properties of the isosceles triangle, Thales found that it was not sufficient, Kant says, to meditate on the figure as it lay before his eyes, or that the conception of it merely existed in his mind. Rather, says Kant, and this is a quote, rather, says Kant, quote, it was necessary to produce these properties by a positive a priori construction and that in order to arrive with certainty at a priori cognition, he must not attribute to the object any other properties than those which necessarily followed from that which he himself had, in accordance with his own concept, placed in the object. 
Now, physics says Kant took longer to develop, but it developed along comparable lines. What Newton and Galileo realized is that reason only perceives that which it produces after its own design. Do you see? You, you, you'd have no way of launching the project of physics on entirely a posteriori grounds. You already have a conceptual framework of lawfulness, orderliness, causality, etc. Uh, to put the ball in play. As Kant says, accidental observations, accidental observations made according to no preconceived plan could not be united under a necessary law. But it is this that reason seeks for and requires. This is what reason is looking for when reason undertakes scientific inquiry. He goes on to say, it is only the principle of reason which can give to concordant phenomena the validity of laws, and it is only an experiment directed by these rational principles that give them any real utility. And so the question is whether metaphysics can be developed along the same lines. This gets back to the prize competition. Must metaphysics uh, be confined to that toppen, that groping around in, in, in the dark? or can it proceed along the lines of a systematic science? Well, this leads Kant to what is often referred to in the secondary literature as his Copernican Revolution, Kant's famous Copernican Revolution. The problem with that rendering is that Kant never uses the term Copernican Revolution, and in fact, he only mentions Copernicus in the second edition of the work, and there only in the preface. And what he refers to there is den ersten Gedank des Copernicus, Copernicus's first thought. He's not treating it as a Copernican revolution. He's not treating what he's doing as a Copernican revolution. Rather, he's very interested in how Copernicus addressed a problem of some weight. Copernicus was contacted by Pope Leo X. Why was that? Anyone? What was troubling His Holiness? May I say His Holiness? What was troubling His Holiness is this. Holy Mother Church had been using this calendar Julius Caesar's time had contrived a calendar. Well, it wasn't a bad calendar. Oh, you're off by a little bit. But of course, by the 14th and 15th centuries, you're off by so much that the variation around Easter Sunday is weighing in at two and three weeks, sometimes longer. So the Pope says to Copernicus, I wonder if you might give us a hand with this. When is Easter Sunday? Copernicus writes back and says, I can't be very helpful. Mathematicians do not agree on the length of the year. And so then Copernicus tries a thought experiment. Just how do things look in case I'm standing on the sun? Well, things look quite different. And in fact, the length of the year gets marvelously orderly if you assume that the sun isn't moving and that the earth is. And the important point is this. What Copernicus establishes is that the observer is not a passive recipient of things that just come in from the solar system. He is an active participant in his own observations. And his position and his velocity determine the model of reality that he will construct. That's the main thing that Kant finds in Copernicus. The answer to the question, what was Kant's Copernican revolution, is I have no idea what you're talking about. So, um, so it, it, may I underscore what, it, what is important in, in what Kant found in the mode of analysis that was adopted by Copernicus. Kant was not only fully versed in the science of astronomy to which he had made uh, significant contributions in, in the pre-critical years, 
But there's no doubt that his reference to this first thought of Copernicus was based on something deeper than an insight into Copernicus's cognitive processes. What Copernicus understood was that reality as known reflects the modes of receptivity by which events in the external world become translated into experience. And Copernicus knew further that it was only by testing various conjectures against the data of experience that a mere casting about might give way to systematic knowledge that will be valid beyond the narrow world of the individual observer. Now again, suppose this you attempt to reduce this to some sort of subjectivity because of all Copernicus was saying is that the model of the solar system you develop just happens to depend on where you are and how you are moving you, you might end up with one of these Protagoras man as the measure of all things what, what Copernicus makes clear is that once you've adopted this different perspective the result is going to be universally distributed across all percipients. It, it's not that, 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 that if Jack and Jill both go to the sun and observe events from the sun's point of view, Jack and Jill will be in, in, in a state of subjectivity and there's no reason to believe that they will agree with each other. No. What is observed, what is, observed is, is a reality that is conditional, that is the representation of that reality is conditional on the place occupied by the observer. How do we know this does not subjectify everything? We know it doesn't because astronomy has developed as a science. One way we know that this works, I shall once more, this is the last time, I did this briefly last week, I shall use an audiovisual aid. And this is the final time this term. You were here for it. All right, look up. Don't, don't be writing now. This is important. Now there's an answer to the question of why that took place. And the answer to the question is that all bodies attract each other with a force that's directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So that Newton, you know, he, in, in the summer of my 23rd year, I devised a calculus of fluxions and appreciated the relationship between the Earth, the Moon, and the other heavenly bodies. When I read that, I reflected on what I had been doing in the summer of my 23rd year. Oh, shame, where is thy blush? Well, um, well, that this happens is not over and against the fact that where we happen to be positioned as observers might have some effect on the measurements that we make. Particularly, for example, if we start going very, very rapidly. If we go really very, very rapidly, then the assumption of mass as unchanging has to surrender to the fact that mass is going to be affected by velocity. And that as we approach the speed of light, the mass is going to approach an infinite magnitude. Right. So what then? Is that subjectivity? No, no, that's drawn from the, that's drawn from the same perspective, the same project, the same developed science that gave you this in the first instance. So again and again, Kant's model is the achievement of physics. The achievement of physics is sufficient to satisfy him that our cognitive resources are capable of unearthing lawfulness in reality, the objective events of the external world. And the question then, again and again, sorry to be so repetitious, is how we do this, given that the resources we bring to bear on the task are perceptual and cognitive. So, to ask how the solar system appears to one standing on the sun, compared with what is seen by one standing on the earth, is to acknowledge that the appearance itself 
must be grounded in non-empirical factors. Cognition doesn't lead then to skepticism regarding the reality of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Rather, it establishes how that very reality will be cognized by the situated observer. The position of the observer now simply becomes another element in the account and not a subjective element. Kant's statement that his own attempt to rescue metaphysics from the incessant groping of metaphysicians suggests a parallel with Copernicus's efforts. As with Copernicus, Kant will, he says, make another trial. Auf anliche Weise versuchen. He's going to perform a Copernicus-like experiment, another trial, a trial of the same sort that Copernicus has tried. How is he going to do this? He's going to suppose that human cognition, by way of the pure categories of the understanding, constitute the means by which we impose structure and lawfulness, such that what we're going to find in our systematic observation of reality are ingredients that we have put there in just the sense that Copernicus's observer on the sun is now an observer that Copernicus has put someplace other than we once found him. So Kant sees the project as, as a kind of experiment. Now he says the understanding has rules, which I must presuppose as being in me prior to objects being given to me. And in this, he's recurring both to the transcendental aesthetic and to the doctrine of the cognitive elements. That is to say, you have to stay with this. Keep in mind what empiricism is claiming. Empiricism is claiming that our ideas are fashioned out of experience, that our experiences are perceptual transactions between an observer and the external world, and that the ideas thus formed, if they have any bearing on external reality, simply are the result of elementary sensations being parlayed into something rather more complex and held together by some principle of association. Kant wants to make clear that on that reading, you could not have a developed science. You couldn't even hold together the concept of causality, let alone show how it operates in the realm of physical reality. So, nothing in the stimulus will support the project of science, and yet the project of science is successful. So, what? So, the necessary ingredients must be supplied by us. Nothing in a priori knowledge can be ascribed to objects, save what the thinking subject derives from itself. Now, in this, Kant is tracking, and I, I shouldn't say tracking because it suggests a dependency that would remain to be established. You might include in your readings a work by Manfred Kean on the influence of the Scottish Enlightenment on German philosophy. Kean does make out a case for Kant having had access to translations, redactions and translations of Reed's inquiry into the human mind. Um, uh, Karl Americh's distinguished uh, Kant scholar has recently argued that there are definitely Reedian resonances, Reedian elements in uh, much of the, in, at least in some of the first critique, and uh, I in several places have, have made, made the same case that, that there are aspects of Reed that match up so well with Kant's argument that it's not a question of dependency, but, but here's how I'd, I'd want you to understand this. Reed and Kant are both troubled most by Hume. Thus, to undertake a criticism of Hume at what is taken to be the weakest points in Hume should result in no surprise if the two critics end up coming up with very similar ideas. Where, where, where what you're getting is something rather more simultaneous than, than, than causal. Now, when, 
Reed takes up the question of causality, on which Kant spends so much ink, uh, particularly in the second analogy. When, when Reed takes it up, he is satisfied that principles of association simply are inapplicable here, that, that no concept of association, e even if the empiricists make clear what they mean by it, no merely associative con concept carries with it the idea of causation. The constant conjunction of events could never give rise, Reed says, could never give rise to the notion of causality except in a creature possessed of active power. Now, I want to flesh this out for you. Imagine yourself to be totally devoid of will, but you do have intelligence which is to say there isn't anything you can resolve to do. You don't even know the meaning of the term resolve. You have no agentic power at all. There's nothing you can do agentically or forbear from doing. Reed's argument is that such a creature, granting that it's an intelligent creature, never on the basis of experience could rise to the concept of causality. The concept of a cause, says Reed, is our externalization of what we recognize in ourselves to be an active power. As I can act and forbear from acting, I understand immediately and intuitively, I understand without reflection, myself to be the source of events that I bring about. It's on the strength of that that I am prepared to make an inference when I see events taking place in a patterned way in the external world that something must have brought them about. So the concept of cause, Reed says, is parasitic on the intuition of active power. Find a creature lacking active power, it could not have the concept of causation. Now that's one way of showing how resources within the organism, resources within the human being, are projected onto the external world to create a representation of events not given by the events themselves. Hume is right insofar as he argues that nothing empirical, not when those billiard balls collide and one moves the other, and Hume says, I must own I do not see some third term betwixt them. Quite so. There is no empirical source of causal dependency. So Hume is right again when he says that, that if you're looking for the locus of causality, well, let me just say it's somewhere between our ears or wherever we, we do these things. But how do we do these things even between our ears? How would it be possible merely on the basis of constant conjunction ever to arrive at the notion of causal dependency? Reed says it's not possible. That the notion of causal dependency is parasitic on the intuitive recognition of oneself as an agent. So there's the Scottish common sense version of the cognitive and volitional resources of the observer now constituting the grounds for causal attributions in contexts in which the external world could provide no cue at all. Recall Reed's comment about no two events have been as constantly conjoined in human experience as day and night, but that no man come of years has ever regarded day as the cause of night or night the cause of day. And you can hear resonances of this when Kant takes up the question of simultaneity. So again, it's back into the observer, back into the cognizer, that we must go to find the sources of these representations, these representations of objective, objective reality. So asserted here, when, when Kant says that 
Nothing in a priori knowledge can be ascribed to objects save what the thinking subject derives from itself. If you wanted to translate that into the Reedian critique of Hume's notion of causality, you, you would say that, that nothing in the external event carries with it the concept, the notion, even the grounding of causality, except in so far as there is a percipient whose, up, whose resources are such that on a priori grounds is able to represent, able to cognize lawful dependencies, causal dependencies, and distinguish them from merely constant conjunctions. Again, understanding, human understanding has rules, which I must presuppose as being in me prior to objects being given to me. Well, here again, the pure concepts of the understanding, w were they not in place? And were you simply the creature that, that a radical empiricism would have you be? What's the basis upon which You'd even connect something like this. Fuzzy white thing, blue tablecloth, hand in the air, etc. How are these connections made? See, on the empiricist account of associationism, the associations we form are not willy-nilly. So why aren't they? You understand that when, when I... Well, I can't get it now. I think it fell someplace. May I use another one? Uh, but, but you're, you're looking at this, which is selectivity. There's a tremendous amount going on as that's going on. Why aren't you looking at this? Why not this? Why not my spectacles? Why not this rather attractive tie that I put on this morning? See? So you are already tuned selectively to bring to bear a certain order on the external world such that some things will be associated and others will be relegated to background considerations. Shall I bring this to life for you? The neonatal rhesus monkey at three hours is shown to have cells in the auditory cortex that respond selectively to the distress cries of that species. That's what I mean by an a priori selectivity of perception. As Reed would argue, were we not thus constituted, you couldn't get across the street for goodness sake. The problem with radical empiricism is that you can't get across the street. You can't even get a street. Well, surely Hume wasn't fooled. No, well, you, look, you don't have to be fooled. Here's a way to be foolish while being extremely intelligent. Have a theory. Um, and, and then defend it against all. John Stuart Mill was doing Greek at eight. And thought that the series of positive integers was in fact an empirical achievement. This is a serious person. Thinks that you got there by counting, or something like counting. This is a serious person. He, he actually represented Oxford for one term. It's an imperfect world. That, that Mill got elected at all is a miracle. But that he only lasted one term was inevitable. Um, so, so, on the Reedian account, quote, even the lowly caterpillar will crawl across a thousand leaves until it finds the one that's right for its diet, is the manner in which Reed illustrates a principle of common sense. Reed is a sort of pre-Darwinian, a providential creator has fitted creatures out to be able to negotiate the requirements of life on earth and when philosophers set out to explain how somehow that's all impossible uh, their systems are reduced to a source of laughter. 
Kant in a much more meticulous, metaphysically rich way, wants to make the same kind of argument that, that the rational structure of science is at once created by the cognitive resources of an intelligent being a priori resources that must be in place for order itself to be cognized and at the same time that apparatus generates representations of external reality in a manner that is objective and the model is the model of science. Well this permits me a very brief canonical summary of a very difficult passage in Kant. And that has to do with how we're going to answer the question how synthetic propositions can be known to be true a priori. The answer is how could they not be? Thank you. You see if we've put it there then how could it be otherwise? How could it be otherwise? You're stunned. The answer to the question, how can we know the truth of our synthetic a priori propositions, is that in fact the propositions to the extent that they constitute a reality that we have framed, that has been structured by the pure concepts of the understanding, will have reason finding its own grounding in the very phenomena that it's setting out to, to explain. It is on the basis of the a priori resources of the cognizer that a lawful reality is made possible in the first instance. So the trick then is not to establish how uh, a priori synthetic propositions can be known to be the case. The trick is how they can be known to be the case by way of resources that do not conduce to subjectivity. And it's on that that Kant's critics and Kant's supporters continue to argue. So that's all I've got for today. But today uh, is the uh, refutation of idealism. Now I, I want to begin by saying that since Kant saw fit, th this is the really new contribution in the second edition. If, if, if Many have argued that the first and second editions are really just tracking each other. But the refutation of idealism is a new edition. It's not only a new edition, but he, he takes time in the preface to the second edition to provide a gloss on, on just this section, which, which is pivotal. So it's a very important part of the argument. Since, since he takes the time to do this, can we agree at the outset that Kant is not an idealist? Because there's a secondary literature that continues to charge him with one or another species of idealism. He certainly owns up to transcendental idealism, which I will get to. But uh, there are learned treatises to the effect that Kant never really stopped being a Barclayan, etc., etc. So um, if, 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 if he's uh, an idealist, it is, as it were, over his dead body, and we'll get to the sternness with which he disabuses himself of attributions of that kind, descriptions of that kind. Well, last week, under the, the major question which he takes to be the central problem of pure reason, namely, uh, how a priori synthetic judgments are possible at all. Uh, if there were not a priori synthetic judgments, the path to skepticism would be direct. direct. It's only in virtue of an argument that works to the effect that we are able to take the manifold of sensuous intuitions, all of these things that converge on the organs of sense, and produce in us sensations out of which appearances take place and these come to represent something come to represent something uh, this is our mode of receptivity this is the basis upon which we have sensibility the pure intuitions 
space and time must be there a priori for us to be receptive to events in the external world. So this is going to give rise to sensibility. But until these sensuous intuitions are partitioned properly, subsumed properly, under the pure categories, there is not understanding. So by way of receptivity, we are able to perceive things, but it's only by way of the categories that we are able to think things, do you see? It's what renders objects thinkable. Now, how about deploying the, these uh, sensuous resources correctly under the categories? Well, this is the task of spontaneity. It, it is guided by principles that he finally throws up his hands and refers to generically as mother wit. And so we are left with this problem. Since so much of this is done by way of a priori principles over which we certainly have no conscious control, does this not itself lead to a kind of skepticism and subjectivity? And the post-Kantian period is littered with treatises on the subjectivism inherent in Kant's first critique. So suppose we take the position that the elements of cognition and the synthesizing that takes place are entirely of our own making and that we can never get out of the box. We can never know things as they really are and, and, and we're right back to that claim in the prolegomena that the embarrassment of philosophy is it still can't establish the existence of an external world. Now we can begin this with uh, Descartes' famous method of doubt, and, and, and I will get to Descartes. But I think Locke is actually the gray eminence behind much of this uh, discussion, though Locke and Berkeley are the figures that Kant points to directly. In Book 2, Chapter 8 of Locke's essay concerning the human understanding, Locke treats us to his distinction between primary and secondary qualities. I want to read you some passages from that because Kant knew his Locke and cites Locke frequently. This is from Book 2, Chapter 8. We find this in Section 8. Our ideas and the qualities of bodies. Whatsoever the mind perceives in itself, or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, that I call idea. And the power to produce any idea in our mind, I call quality of the subject wherein that power is. Just previously in seven. Ideas in the mind are no more the likeness of something existing without us than the names that stand for them are the likeness of our ideas, which yet upon hearing they are apt to excite in us. So he's, he, he's declaring that the ideas have no more likeness to that of which they are ideas than the names we have for things are than, than glass as a noun, is like this, do you see? Now the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Qualities thus considered in bodies are, first, such as are utterly inseparable from the body, in what state soever it be, and such as in all the alterations and changes it suffers, all the force can be used upon it, it constantly keeps. These are properties a body keeps under all conditions of alteration. Take a grain of wheat, he says, divide it into two parts. Each part still has, here come the primary qualities, what does each part still have? Solidity, extension, figure, and mobility. Divide it again, it retains still the same qualities. These I call original or primary qualities of body, which I think we may observe to produce simple ideas in us, namely the simple ideas of what? Solidity, extension, figure, motion or rest, and number. So, his young friend Newton need not worry what 
the Newtonian world talks about, which is figure, extension, motion, and so forth, those are things to which we have, oddly, direct access. We, we, we see those things, we experience those things as they are. Secondary qualities of bodies, such qualities which in truth are nothing in the objects themselves, but the power to produce various sensations in us by their primary qualities, i.e. by the bulk figure, texture, and motion of their insensible parts, their corpuscular parts, do you see? And what comes under this heading? Colors, sound, taste, etc. These are secondary qualities. Well, my goodness. So, when Kant, uh, uh, by the way, when Thomas Reed looks at, at this, he refers to Locke's position and Descartes' position, and Aristotle's position, Berkeley's position, everybody's position, as, quote, the ideal theory. The ideal theory, Reed says, is a theory according to which we have no contact with the objects in the external world directly, but only by way of some mode of mental representation, such that the only thing we can talk about with any authority are the contents of our own minds, and not the external world. And Reed says, early on in my philosophical career, I tended to side with Berkeley on these matters. Then, having stepped into a dirty kennel and banged my head frequently against a signpost, I reluctantly came to the conclusion that there really are objects in the external world, very much like what I see them to be, do you see? Locke and Descartes and company have generated something, Reed says, which, if true, this is a wonderful Reedian line, if the ideal theory is true, I lay my hands across my lips and become a skeptic. So Reed is going to defend a, a direct realism against this account. Um, Kant is comparably agitated. Of course, when Kant gets agitated, you get the densest parts of the critique of pure reason. And when Reed gets agitated, you get some wonderful prose, actually, worth taking on a picnic. Do it. Treat yourselves to it. It's, it's better than the telegraph. Oh. Well, Kant sees two forms of skepticism arising from this tradition. The skepticism espoused by Descartes and that espoused by Berkeley. At B274, he identifies each of these clearly. What both have in common, says Kant, quote, is the theory which declares the existence of objects in space outside us to be merely doubtful and indemonstrable or to be false and impossible. The former is the problematic idealism of Descartes, the latter is the dogmatic idealism of Berkeley. Descartes worried that the whole damn thing might be a dream state, he's not sure, he frets. And Berkeley, of course, declares the whole notion of an independently subsisting material world, a mind-independent material world, as simply impossible. How many of you agree with Berkeley on that? I knew it. Not one. All right, let's do it then, just for a couple of minutes. So you think that there is a mind-independent physical reality. Physical reality. A material reality. You know, something that makes a sound when you hit it, has an odor, is visible, is yellow, is square, You, you, you think that if you were to strip what you regard as physical reality of all in principle sensible properties, there'd be something left over. Well, what might that be? 
That is something to which there is no attending sense or mind. Something beheld by no consciousness anywhere. And nonetheless, you're prepared with a kind of epistemic fundamentalism <laughs> to say, notwithstanding to the contrary that no mind in the imaginable cosmos apprehends any aspect of this entity, I declare without more, nonetheless it exists. Oh, stop it. Oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, so Barclay simply uh, wants to, uh, in the dialogue be, be, be between Hylas and Philonus, the friend of, of reason and Hylas is who this, the materialist, you see. Uh, he, he simply wants to make clear to him that, look, that don't worry about this, this argument of mine. There are still carpets and bottles and computers and carrying cases and so forth. What there isn't is a mind independent, a totally mind independent, independently existing material world. Rather, everything with real existence subsists in the attending mind, in some attending mind. Essa est percipi. To be is to be perceived. Well, so the tallest mountain didn't exist till someone was there to perceive it? How about the backside of the moon before the Apollo program, etc., etc.? Now, Barclay is a very able philosopher, optic specialist, world class mathematician. So, again, he's not the neighborhood nitwit. So, he, he, he understands questions of that sort. And on the general question, what is the ontological status of that which no human percipient has experienced or even could experience. If it is to be granted ontological status, it must be because it is held in some mind. And what Bishop Barclay says, of course, it is eternally held in the mind that made it. Well, sorry about that. That's your little Sunday sermon. No extra charge. So. He became a bishop fairly late in life, Bishop of Cloyne, and uh, he, he wasn't made a bishop because he was doing battle with, as he said, atheists and materialists, though I'm sure it helped. Well, Barclay famously dissolved the distinction between Locke's primary and secondary qualities on the grounds that all experience is mediated. Accordingly, he reached the conclusion that the notion of a mind independent material world was simply incoherent. Thus, to be is to be perceived, and that's the triumphant motto of Barclay. Barclay decided that what we needed was a, a new kind of university. He came to America to raise money. He was going to build a college in Bermuda. And uh, his first child was uh, actually born in, in Rhode Island. And um, Barclay had a house there. It's a wonderful place if you ever get a chance to visit it with a lot of Barclay and little optical knickknacks and so forth. Uh, yes, I've been and uh, looked over the stuff. Had a tour guide who was trying to tell me that Barclay had an interest in optics and I was very appreciative to learn that. Now consider Descartes' conclusions, which he reaches in his meditations. He knows from experience that the effects he feels are not willed by him. He says in the third meditation that he will feel heat whether he wants to or not. And he concludes from this that his sensations and ideas come to him from sources other than himself. So he's, he's prepared to accept that much. But this comes from a source other than himself. But then dread skepticism, 
promptly sets in, as we hear Descartes say, quote, Although these apparently adventitious ideas do not depend on my will, it does not follow that they must come from things located outside me. There may be some other faculty not yet fully known to me, which produces these ideas without any assistance from external things. This is, after all, just how I've always thought ideas are produced in me when I am dreaming. So he might be dreaming the whole thing. Or they might be the gift of that evil demon, you see, which is going to, which is going to corrupt his understandings and delude him into believing all sorts of things that are not so. This is what the cogito is all about. He's trying to find something to counter the evil demon's uh, uh, efforts with, you see. Because even to be deceived, even if, even if you grant the evil demon the ability to perpetrate illusory and, 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 and impose delusional states, etc., just to deceive Descartes, Descartes must be a thinking thing. He declares himself to be, in addition to an extended thing, which is an inference, do you see? Can't, can't, can't prove that part. But that he is a thinking thing, there is no doubt. Were he not a thinking thing, he couldn't even cogitate the possibility of an extended thing. So the cogito is, Reed I think was not entirely fair to Descartes saying that a man who disbelieves his own existence is no more fit to be reasoned with than one who thinks he's made of glass. Um, Descartes didn't set out on the cogito end of things because he disbelieved his own existence. The, 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 the aim was not an ontological aim of establishing that he existed, but an epistemological aim. What kind of knowledge claim defeats a total skepticism? And one knowledge claim that defeats a total skepticism is the cogito. Capito? Cogito? Yes? Okay. Later in the same section, well, well now, now, so far things have been fairly tame. Now, enter Hume. Hume will illustrate the impoverishment of reason in relation to the knowable world, and in so many words make clear that there can't be synthetic propositions known to be true a priori. Hume dismisses the whole thing this way. Suppose a person, though endowed with the strongest faculties of reason and reflection, to be brought on a sudden into this world. He would indeed immediately observe a continual succession of objects and one event following another. But he would not be able to discover anything farther. He would not at first, by any reasoning, be able to reach the idea of cause and effect, since the particular powers by which all natural operations are performed never appear to the senses. Such a person, without more experience, could never employ his conjecture or reasoning concerning any matter of fact, or be assured of anything beyond what was immediately present to his memory and his senses. Later in the same section, quote, by what argument can it be proved that the perceptions of the mind must be caused by external objects and could not arise either from the energy of the mind itself or from some other cause still more unknown to us? It is acknowledged that in fact many of these perceptions arise not from anything external as in dreams, madness and other diseases. It's a question of fact whether the perceptions of the senses be produced by external objects. But here, experience is and must be entirely silent. The mind has never anything present to it but perceptions, and cannot possibly reach any experience of their connection with objects. The supposition of such a connection is therefore without any foundation in reasoning. You won over to that, aren't you? Okay. Hume is marvelous. Do you know when he'd go to France, he was such a wonderful conversationalist. They couldn't, 
particularly the brilliant women of the French salons, would always want to chat up Hume. I, I, I have great affection for Hume, notwithstanding my disagreement with his philosophy. First, we share a similar profile. Um, relatively rare in the annals of philosophy. The svelte Frenchman, you know, they do all that sword play. I can't imagine Hume doing anything like that. But the svelte Frenchman, envious of the attention Hume would be getting, would stand in the corner and they'd point to corpulent Hume, chatting up all the ladies, and they would say, and the word was made flesh. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, but you see the state that Hume leaves our reasoning and our experiences in. They simply can't establish, in addition to my perceptions, the fact of an external world bringing these about. This is not within the ambit of reason's powers, and of course it can't be established by experience because all experience is supplying are just those perceptions. Well, if Kant is going to reply to challenges of this sort, he, he might find himself moving into a kind of idealism, because after all, at the level of the sensuous intuitions, we're talking about representations. No one has access directly to noumenal reality, to things as in themselves they really are. So Kant uh, understands that uh, the charges after the first critique's first edition, the charge that his argument is itself a species of idealism has to be dealt with. He says, look, there's, there's a term I do accept. I accept, uh, I, I, I qualify myself as a transcendental idealist. And then he says this at A369. By transcendental idealism, I mean the doctrine that appearances are to be regarded as being one and all representations only, not things in themselves, and that time and space are therefore only the sensible forms of our intuition, not the conditions of objects viewed as things in themselves. So he's again making the distinction between phenomena and noumena. Now why this wall constantly being built lest anyone think we have access to things as in themselves they really are? Do you see how that will lead to, to, to an undefeatable skepticism? If you claim that the contents of your consciousness just are things as in themselves they really are, then you live in a world exhausted by ideas because that's what the contents of consciousness are. So there would be no distinction whatever between an actual external world and the conscious representation of that world because in consciousness it wouldn't be a representation. It would be things as in themselves they really are. So Kant is aware of the fact that once you argue for access to noumenal reality, ironically, you've bought into a skepticism that probably is more severe than even Barclays, Humes, and Descartes. In my notes I say, after all, if there were no distinction possible between noumena and phenomena, between an entity as in itself it really is, and the representation of that entity, it would be Barclay's idealism that probably would be the last word. Now that the external world is in fact represented ra does raise a question as to uh, uh, what has to be in place for there to be representations in the first instance. All that is per all, all, uh, as all perceptual representations are spatio-temporal, and as neither space nor time is given in the array of impinging stimuli, we get back to the transcendental aesthetic. So we know that that uh, for perception itself there must be a priori a framework uh, such that the organs that grant us sensibility package the input in a characteristic way. 
package it in a way that the stimuli themselves can't convey. Time is not in the stimulus, space is not in the stimulus. Now remember, knowledge in Kant is technically used. For there to be knowledge, there must be both sensibility and understanding. So what cannot in principle enter into experience cannot in principle be known. He states clearly how his use of transcendental is to be understood with respect to transcendental idealism. As it extends its influence, this is a quote over all that follows. Not every kind of knowledge a priori should be called transcendental, but only that by which we know that and know how certain representations can be, can be employed or are possible purely a priori. So again, he wants transcendental understood as an enabling condition, a necessary state of affairs if something else is to take place. If there is to be experience, necessarily there must be what? There must be a mode of sensibility, etc. If there is to be understanding, there must be a categorical framework in which the products of, of experience are properly deployed and organized. But of course, if appearances are the only source of the contents of perception, we find ourselves embracing some sort of Barclayan idealism. In part two of the Prolegomena at 36 and following, Kant does leave himself open to such an interpretation. Here's Kant sounding very much like an idealist, and I don't mean a transcendental idealist. He declares that nature in the material sense is known, quote, by means of the constitution of our sensibility according to which it is in its own way affected by objects which are themselves unknown to it and totally distinct from the appearances. Well, this begins to sound somewhat Barclay, and you can see why, why uh, uh, his critics would charge him with idealism. And charge him with a kind of psychologism, since this it begins to sound well, it's not quite as arid as cognitive psychology. I don't think anything is quite that arid. But it does begin to sound a bit like, you know, cognitive psychology 101. Uh, we've got uh, schematic drawings of uh, the senses leading to uh, short-term memory, going to long-term memory, going to the amygdala and generating that sort of thing. If he were alive today, he might be tempted to draw things like that because of his passion for categorizing. Well, he's got to refute the idealisms of Descartes and Berkeley and show that transcendental idealism has nothing in common with those. And that's the task of the refutation of idealism. Um, it's a dense argument, to say the least. It has given rise to a vast secondary literature. It's so vast that even I've contributed to it. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, and uh, try to save Kant from the charge that there are gaps in his argument. And uh, I have a recent article titled Kant's Seamless Refutation of Idealism. How confident am I in the conclusions I've reached? Not a bit. Uh, how does one know? The core question is how best to explain. Kant sees this. How do we explain the startling agreement between the perceptual cognitive representations that are granted and the things external to ourselves? Or, as I've said a couple of times in these lectures, how do we explain getting to the moon and back. But do you see, this is not just some sort of uh, reasonable correlation between guesses we have as to the external world and what the external world maybe is somewhat like. This is an extraordinary journey from Earth to moon and back based on calculations and equations and rocketry and radar and so forth. So, so you might say, in quasi-Kantian terms, since we did that, 
what are the necessary preconditions, what's the transcendental argument according to which you can go to the moon and come back. And the transcendental argument is there must be a fundamental and objective agreement between the pure concepts of the understanding as we have subsumed the data of sense under these categories and the validity of our representations of the external world. That match, if it, if it weren't valid, the achievements would be unimaginable. That's saying that we've done it and that something must be there for us to have done it. But how do we establish the reality of things outside ourselves in the first instance? Suppose the whole space program is a kind of dream. There are still people who think that the whole thing was done on a Hollywood sound lot, you know, that nobody actually ever did go to the moon. There are people who believe things like that. Well, to establish the reality of things outside ourselves, Kant says he will turn idealism all idealisms against themselves. And he sets out to establish that the very possibility of self-awareness, Descartes or Berkeley's own inner sense, requires an awareness of the external world. That is to say, it is only by way of what is also uns, it is only by way of our access to what is outside ourselves that we are able to establish that inner life of conscious experience. That's what he means by turning idealisms against themselves. As he says at B274, he says uh, that inner sense requires an awareness by, by, by way of outer sense. Now the, the, the argument as it's developed finds uh, Kant saying this. Listen carefully now, it's dense. One is conscious of one's existence as determined in time. You're conscious of your existence as determined in time. But all determination of time presupposes something permanent in perception. Now determined here is the translation of the German bestimmt. And bestimmt in German has a very wide extension. Uh, it includes, it, it, it is used to refer to establishing something as certain or as definite. To set something, to fix something in place, to render something firm, as in höflich, aber bestimmt, polite but firm, do you see? Determined probably wouldn't have been the, the, the word I, I, I would have chosen. I would say one is conscious of one's existence as set or fixed in time. One is conscious of, one existence, of one's existence as fixed in time, but all this presupposes something permanent in perception. That is, look, a parade of successive states of consciousness presupposes something static in relation to which other items are time varying. It's, it's the stationary nature of this or of the room, of the spatial framework against which, look, things vary in time, do you see? So time variation presupposes a static background or a permanent background. That permanent background is provided by the pure intuition of space. So absent the spatial framework, you could not have that sequence of events in inner space, which just is the march of conscious events. The permanent can't be within the conscious precipient for that very consciousness for its own successive states to exist requires something permanent that is external to itself. Only through perception of an objective thing outside myself can I be conscious of an enduring self possessed of successive inner states.
Kant concludes that self-consciousness requires perceptual awareness of objects external to oneself. This is the counter to an idealist claim that the mind has direct access only to its own internal states and processes. Do you see? If what the idealist is claiming is that all of my epistemic claims are tied to the parade of experiences in my own mind, Kant is at pains to establish that that very parade, that very conscious life, that very possessed set of inner state experiences cannot exist except in so far as there is a permanent external world constituting the background for it. There could in principle be an idealized mind, but it could not be anyone's, for it would lack the conditions necessary for self-consciousness. And this is so because self-consciousness requires conditions whereby the mind's own operations can be determined in time. You'll see this much more clearly when we get to the question of the uh, unity of apperception and Kant on the self. Now Kant is clear on this when he says, for in what we entitle soul, namely myself as an appearance of inner sense, everything is in continual flux and there is nothing abiding except, if we may so express ourselves, the I. He says this at A381. But this I is but an intellectualized subject term, something of an indexical that merely locates the place of the continuing flux. So what does he conclude? He says at B275, this is in the refutation of idealism section, he says, the mere but empirically determined consciousness of my own existence proves the existence of objects in space outside me. It's from the fact that I have a conscious inner life that there must be an external reality that constitutes the framework of permanence absent which there could not be the successive time-determined life of the mind. Well, there's still a hint of subjectivism here, and it's only when we return to Kant's treatment of the pure intuitions that this unwanted subjectivity gives way to what is a priori, universal, and necessary. He says this as early as B2. We shall understand by a priori knowledge, not knowledge independent of this or that experience, but knowledge absolutely independent of all experience. Opposed to it is empirical knowledge, which is knowledge possible only a posteriori, that is, only by way of experience. But experience never confers on its judgments true or strict universality. If then a judgment is thought with strict universality, that is in such a manner that no exception is allowed as possible, then it is not derived from experience, but is valid absolutely a priori. And he takes his argument against idealism to reach that degree of necessity and universality. Do you see, th this, this time-determined internal life of the mind is not unique to Jack or Jill. This, these constitute the necessary conditions for there to be successive states of mind as such, necessary and universal, therefore not the gift of experience. So in the end is Kant some sort of idealist? Uh, this is a question that has spawned a substantial secondary literature. I can tell you, as far as I can tell, no end in sight. As long as D fills required dissertations, there will be additional work on Kant as an idealist, I'm sure, and then other work on Kant as not an idealist and probably two or three hundred on Kant could be an idealist under a certain set of descriptions, etc. Well, if he is an idealist, um, then it's over his own explicit objections. 
He was at pains to trace the rationale that would find, as he put it, even, quote, good Barclay degrading bodies to mere illusion, close quote. And Kant, like Reed, would have none of that. That's it. Well, let me begin with one of the most famous of the passages in the first critique. This is at B74. Without sensibility, no object would be given to us. Without understanding, no object would be thought. Thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. So we see that for con concepts, the conceptual dimension is actually the seeing element in experience. For there to be an experience, in contrast to a sensation, to a bare sensation, to the triggering of events in a sensory organ, that, that is not an experience. For there to be an experience, there must be an experience of something. And for there to be a something, it has to be an entity subsumable under a general class of things, whether it's a chair or a person. So there is a required conceptual framework for experience itself, and it is experience and understanding that together constitute the foundations of all knowledge. Without these concepts, no more than a parade of sensations would take place, and the, this parade could never rise to the level of a this or a that. Now, I'd not want you to understand this as a species of cognitive relativism. This part of Kant's argument, with appropriate reservations, may be taken to be a chapter in the very anthropology of thought, but not as a species of relativism. And when I say a chapter in the anthropology of thought, recall how frequently Kant reminds us <clears throat> that the argument in place pertains to us, pertains to a creature of a certain kind, pertains to human beings. I think I've mentioned in an earlier lecture that, uh, that, that, that he expresses impatience with those who are impatient with this divide he's established between phenomena and noumena. Doesn't this lead to skepticism? Why indeed can we not comprehend things as in themselves they really are? And Kant is prepared to say, well, imaginably there, there is a creature that could, but not us. And that people who are impatient with that division are asking, this is a very nearly a quote, are asking for the impossible. They're asking for us not to be human beings. So, it's not a relativistic epistemology, but it is an anthropology of knowledge. It presupposes a creature of a certain kind. And that's the only kind Kant can discuss with any authority, and it's the only kind to which Kant's argument can relate directly and with authority. Uh, he probably would be interested in that literature that we've spawned in the last 30 years on what it's like to be a bat, but I don't think he'd be interested for long. Now the manner in which the external world is objectified is according to rules that are at once universal and necessary within the community of rational human beings. This is another way of saying this isn't a relativism that leads to skepticism. The rules that govern the synthesis of the manifold of sensuous content, content, these rules are universal and necessary. It's conceivable that some different creature might subsume appearances under different rules. That, of course, is not only something we don't know, it's something we couldn't know. The emphasis here is on what is knowable in principle by the sort of creature that we happen to be. So knowledge in the Kantian scheme is, a, is an amalgam of sensibility and understanding, such that what 
cannot in principle enter into experience cannot in principle be known. And so when he says right at the outset that of course Hume was right in saying that all of our knowledge arises from experience. That part of Hume Kant has no trouble with at all and he emphasizes it. He says the mistake Hume made was that in assuming that all of our knowledge arises from experience our knowledge is grounded in experience. And what Hume failed to appreciate is the necessary elements of cognition that must be in place for there to be experience and for experience to merge with understanding in a rule governed way in such a way as to be generative of knowledge. You know all that. To be known an object must go beyond an element of experience and it must be located within a conceptual framework. So what's required now is an argument that establishes the necessity and universality of the pure concepts. How come they're not just haphazard? Required is what Kant refers to as the transcendental deduction of the categories. Now he says not every kind of knowledge a priori should be called transcendental. But that only by which we know that and know how certain representations can be employed or are possible purely a priori. Transcendental in the sense of establishing the necessary enabling conditions for something else to take place. So how do sensations of the most rudimentary sort enter into the formation of concepts? And how does the manifold of otherwise disparate appearances become a unified experience in a given consciousness. Remember, we not only have to get all of this flotsam unified, but it must be unified in a consciousness, and it has to be unified in a consciousness that actually has a street address, so that all this is taking place in you, or you. It's not just out there somewhere. So there has to be a self-consciousness in which all of this somehow takes place. And this has to be achieved without begging the question. Now, um, I do want to say something I, I have before on, on the kind of deduction that Kant has in mind, this transcendental deduction of the categories. I mentioned this to you before. Kant did have an interest, uh, Kant had an interest in everything. But he did have an interest in, in certain uh, political events of the time, jurisdictional disputes, boundary and border disputes in various German principalities and so forth. He didn't make a close study of this. But anyone with an interest in that certainly would have been exposed to what were referred to as deduction briefen. These are filings, formal filings. Today we'd, 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 we'd talk about them as, as um, legal briefs to establish the authenticity of a claim. And that's the sort of deduction he has in mind. He's, he's talking about an argument that a jury would find compelling. In other words, it's not a logical deduction of the categories, it's a transcendental deduction, and the deduction in question is to make out this case. Since we can do such and such, since this happens across all of us, there's no question about it, don't you agree that for this to be the case, that must be the case? For the conceptual lives we live, for the knowledge claims that we routinely make, do you not see that there are certain pure categories of the understanding that must be in place, they must constitute the template, the framework, the necessary conditions for the knowledge we know we have, you see. It's that kind of argument. Uh, now, he, so he must provide the, the argument for the conclusion that we are in a position to make objective judgments regarding entities in the external world. And judgment now becomes pivotal. It's, it's the linchpin of the 
cognitive processes that he's trying to establish. Judgment itself. Ortile. So we see that an experience is of a something. It's not merely a parade of disconnected sensations. They must be a means not contained in the sensations themselves by which these experiences are forged. And Kant says the way to begin an understanding of how this takes place is with two supreme principles. So we now get to the two supreme principles of the first critique. One pertains to sensibility and one pertains to understanding. The supreme principle in relation to sensibility is that the manifold of intuition, quote, should be subject to the formal conditions of space and time. That's the transcendental aesthetic. The necessary enabling conditions for there to be sensibility is a spatio-temporal framework, not in the stimulus. That's something that we, we bring to the situation. That's the supreme principle regarding sensibility. The supreme principle in relation to understanding is that, quote, all the manifold of intuition should be subject to conditions of the original synthetic unity of our perception. A typical Kantian phrase, you're sitting there as if you had been paralyzed by a, by a poison dart. If I say it again, your facial expression will not change one whit. I will prove this by saying it again. The supreme principle in relation to the understanding Listen now, you're Oxford students, meaning nothing gets by you. This will. The supreme principle in relation to the understanding is that, quote, all the manifold of intuition should be subject to conditions of the original synthetic unity of apperception. What's the manifold of intuition? It's all that impinging stuff, do you say? spatio-temporally received, you see, intuition, anschauung, this mode of reception. And what has to happen to it? It has to get synthesized and it has to get unified. I shall give this to you. Um, if it were the States, you could probably put this on Sesame Street. I will give it to you by way of Sesame Street. Part of the manifold of intuition is hot. Another part of it is black. A third part of it is viscous. A fourth part of it is wet. And a fifth part of it is a pungent aroma. Absent the absent the synthetic unity of our perception, you will never get a cup of coffee out of this. Ah, now, now the eyebrows lower a bit and the poison has worn off. So we've got to have the synthetic unity of our perception imposed on these sensuous intuitions, the manifold of sensuous intuitions, which by the way do not come carrying a code for unification. We provide the unification. The external world provides the manifold. Otherwise known as, we want a technical term for this, otherwise known as the mess. All right. And out of that we make a cup of coffee. Constantly on my mind during these lectures, by the way. Now, where the jury uh, in front of Kant as he argues his case, and we have to judge whether he's made his case for the transcendental deduction of the categories. The transcendental, as noted, refers to the necessary conditions for there to be knowledge at all. He puts it this way as early as A12. I call all knowledge transcendental if it is occupied not with objects, but with the way that we can possibly know objects even before we experience them, you see. 
It's the rule according to which we can have objective knowledge even before our eyes are open. How do we want to understand this? We have a little booklet called the Rules of Chess, right? So before you ever buy pieces or open up the board, or anything, that's every permissible move that can take place in a game properly called the game of chess. All knowledge is transcendental. Such knowledge is transcendental when, in fact, it's occupied not with that's a watch, these are glasses, but the very possibility of knowing anything before we experience anything. The conditions that must be in place for us to know things in a certain way. What way? Uh, our way of knowing things. So the task of the transcendental deduction finally is the question how do we come to have knowledge of objects and more precisely the task is to establish the warrant or the justification of any knowledge claim we might make that would be validly tied to experience. Well, let me summarize the approach through a series of steps from sensation to appearances to concepts and then to one's own concepts. The process begins with sensation, a response or reaction on the part of sensory organs to stimuli originating in the external world. And then by way of the pure intuitions of time and space, the necessary enabling conditions of sensibility itself, the sensations are transformed into appearances. It's only when these appearances are subsumed under the pure categories of the understanding that we can be said to have an experience of what is present in the external world. As he says at B161, the necessary conditions by which there is the very possibility of experience are the pure co concepts of the understanding. Well, this gets us back to a question that I think I raised uh, second week. Well, does a dog see a tree? A creature, a creature without the a priori categories could have the same sensations, indeed these sensations could give rise to the same appearances as we possess, but not the same experiences. Such a creature would see a tree, but not experience it as such. And again, you, you, you know, we all know, dogs see everything. What they don't see, they smell. This becomes clearer in Kant's treatment of judgment, which allows us to trace the argument from the subjectivity of mere perception. And this is a key distinction that I, I do hope you'll rivet to the most functional part of what? Frontal cortex, I should think. And bits of, bits of uh, limbic system. You want to remember this even viscerally, do you see? So when you hear it again, you get a funny sensation, like I heard this before somewhere. And that's the distinction between judgments of perception and judgments of experience. Judgments of perception versus judgments of experience. The subjectivity of our perceptions being what it is will give rise to a subjectivity of judgment. But as experiences arise from the subsumption of content under necessary and universal categories, the judgments of experience are common across percipients. Now that's going to be part of the argument that has to be made. Now, integral to this entire process is the faculty of imagination. It's through the imagination that concepts and intuitions become synthesized, and become synthesized according to a universal rule, which Kant refers to as a schema. This is the way the understanding will rise to the level of empirical knowledge and objective empirical knowledge. 
The imagination is what has the power of drawing together certain elements in an otherwise disconnected assortment of sensations. Drawing together just those elements that constitute a knowable something. But the imagination as such does not yield knowledge, rather it makes knowledge possible. It's only when the synthesis of the manifold is then brought into, brought under the pure categories of the understanding, that knowledge as such arises. Now you might say, well, the imagination, the word itself is suggestive of a kind of subjectivity. Am I using my imagination when I, when I do this? And Kant wants to be clear that the process of synthesis is not arbitrary. Indeed, if the resulting synthesis generates the same object for all comparably situated observers, then you certainly can't say that this is the outcome of some merely probable or, or iffy uh, process. There must be a framework, there must be rules by which the elements of the manifold are pulled and held together. And this, of course, is what the pure concepts of the understanding are all about. So you begin to see how the famous transcendental deduction unfolds. Kant begins with, the, with an indubitable feature of the understanding, namely the stability of representations, the virtually universal manner in which comparably positioned observers judge the objects of experience. Now let me not be cryptic on this point. Look. Take a look. <coughs> Well, take a look. All right. Now, I'm larger on your retina. My surface reflectance has just changed. An entirely different configuration of stimuli has just occurred, as it has again just occurred. Every aspect of the external world changes as your head movement changes as you inspire and breathe out. Every time you do this, the position of the external world changes, do you say? Now you've got this incessant system of continuous alteration, constant alteration, in a world that nonetheless contains things that retain their resemblance throughout all these transformations. How does that happen? It happens in so far as some aspect of the external world remains a this. And it remains a this by being conceptualized. So that you are no longer limited to judgments of perception, which can be exquisitely detailed, but you now are in a position to make judgments of experience. Yes, as the chap on the hill approaches me, his retinal projection gets larger and larger. A judgment of perception, which by the way in classical psychophysics would be called the stimulus error, is now corrected by the fact that you happen to know it's a person whose size doesn't change as he gets closer to you. Do you see what I'm talking about? The difference between something that's perceptually governed and something that's conceptually governed. Right. Percepts and concepts are quite different. <coughs> I mentioned St. Augustine's uh, engagement of that problem. I didn't mention that, did I? Uh, shall I take a moment? Because it shows up again. In fact, Descartes uses exactly the same example that Augustine does, and in a different context. Augustine uses his to become a saint, and uh, Descartes to retain his credentials as a philosopher. Um, well, how do you become, well, you can become a saint in a lot of different ways, but uh, Saint Augustine was on the way to becoming a saint by effectively battling heresies. Now here's a heresy for you. Of course it couldn't take place today, nobody would think this way today. 
When people talk about God and tell you what they really mean by God, they assign attributes that, by the very nature of God, are beyond the range of possible experience. God is an infinite this, a maximum that, all you can ask for, etc., etc., has no moving parts, occupies no space, uh, the whole cosmos is somehow in his imagination. You know the story. So, there isn't any empirical grounding for epistemic claims regarding God. So when you talk about God, quite literally, technically, you're talking about something you couldn't possibly know anything about. Because there is no perceptual grounding for the knowledge claim. Right? This is the sort of thing, I won't name names, but I mean we could, we could bring in a an estimable group of Oxford leading lights probably saying my point exactly well so St. Augustine said well look um, every normally sighted person can perceive uh, a geometric object with four equal sides pairs of sides subtending angles of 90 degrees. We, we call that a square. And as everyone can perceive such a figure, so everyone can conceive of such a figure. Of course, everyone can also conceive of a kiliagon, which is a thousand-sided figure, but though you can conceive of a kiliagon, you can't perceive it because the angular uh, changes are so slight as not to be resolvable by way of our visual acuity. So you see, you can have quite a clear conception of something that really exists without perceiving it. Descartes uses the exactly that example, by the way, a few years later. Descartes died in 1650. St. Augustine was hitting home runs earlier, end of the 4th century AD. Uh, well, whatever. What, what does that have to do with this? Well, what it has to do with is this. We will all have the same objective. We will all have the same judgments of experience when it comes to kiliagons. We might have radically different judgments of perception when it comes to kiliagons. So intersubjective agreement, not to mention the stable cognition of objects under widely varying conditions, is now explained by way of, and here I quote Kant, remember what we're trying to explain now, intersubjective agreement and stable cognitions of objects under widely varying conditions explained by way of quote a catalog of all the originally pure concepts of the synthesis which the understanding contains a priori and these concepts alone entitle it to be called a pure understanding inasmuch as only by them can it render the manifold of intuitions conceivable. In other words, think an object. This division is made systematically from a common principle, namely the faculty of judgment, which is just the same as the power of thought. This then is the outline of the transcendental deduction. For our representations, uh, to serve as possibilities for knowledge, they must become conceptually grounded. The categories delineated in, the, in what Kant calls the metaphysical deduction now are seen as necessary for knowledge to be derived from experience. Now, he's going to give us a metaphysical deduction, followed then by a transcendental deduction. The metaphysical deduction, to some extent, tracks Aristotle's uh, uh, famous uh, delineation of the categories. Kant's complaint with Aristotle, it's, it's not so much a complaint, he said, look, 
you know, Aristotle had these categories. Kant's categories are going to be different. And they're going to be much more carefully arranged. He said, what Aristotle was doing, it's a mild complaint. Aristotle was just listing the properties of things that one knows about and subsuming them under general categories. He was pretty much governed by empirical considerations. Uh, comes, well, I, I don't want to say he comes close to saying, you know, Aristotle, that Greek Humean. Well, Aristotle was not, not, not a Humean at all, and I don't think Kant would have seen him that way. But he sees Aristotle as sort of just putting together a lot of categories because if you get enough of them in place, it'll pretty much account for all the properties of things that we know about. A metaphysical deduction is different. A metaphysical deduction has to do with the number, the minimum and defined number of categories for all conceivable possible objective knowledge. The argument as to what you would have to have minimally and devoid of all empirical content. This is what you have to have before the eyes are open. Now once that metaphysical deduction is in place, the transcendental deduction then becomes the argument to the effect that what you have to have is what we have and that's what grounds our objective knowledge of the external world. So the transcendental deduction then becomes uh, the uh, means by which uh, what, what would have to be in place is seen to be in place and operating with necessity and universality. In the prolegomena at uh, 297 to 302, um, Kant does draw very clearly this distinction between judgments of perception and judgments of experience. Do keep in mind that judgments of perception are subjectively valid. When I judge honey to be sweet, I'm connecting two entities. A physical object that is honey and a subjective sensation of sweetness. There's no guarantee that others will have the same experience or that I will on repeated encounters or that my own sensation is not the result of something other than honey. Quite simply, they are not the stuff of which a science of nature is made. But judgments of experience, as noted, are quite different. With these, we begin to, uh, with what is given by way of sensuous intuition, but this is then subsumed under concepts that are based on the pure categories of the understanding, and these are universally operative within the realm of human cognition. Unlike the judgments of perception, the judgments of experience hold good, not only for us, but for everybody. And so we now have an objective validity, which says Kant is the same as necessary universality. Objective validity he equates with necessary universality. It's in this sense that the possibility of nature becomes tied to the possibility of experience itself. Well, now we can get to B75 again, this maxim. Without sensibility, no object would be given to us, and without understanding, no object would be thought. Thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. So in the absence of the categories, our perceptions would, quote, be without an object, merely a blind play of representations, less even than a dream, you see, if you couldn't conceptualize things. Note that the various elements of the objects of thought are synthesized, but a given object is encountered, as I noted, under radically different conditions at different times. It retains its identity as a this or that, surely not as a result of anything delivered by the senses. In fact, to the extent that we are in the thrall of our sensory processes, it 
it can never be the same object on any successive sampling. All right, so that's the transcendental deduction of the categories. It has spawned a huge literature, much of it critical. And there are problems that arise uh, within the argument itself. Some of these were duly noted, if I may say with all due respect, were rather more discerningly noted by Kant's contemporaries than by many of my contemporaries. But those are not the same contemporaries, by the way, in case you're wondering about that. Um, Kant is clear on the need for a process by which otherwise various and varying representations are held together. He describes the process of synthesis as, quote, the act of putting different representations together and grasping what is manifold in them in one cognition. Now integral to this process is what we've referred to in an earlier lecture, spontaneity. Sensations as such are devoid of structure. Synthesis yields structure and spontaneity gives rise to creative and flexible cognitions. We, we're not zombie-like in our, in, in our modes of representation. But then serious questions do arise, and, and, and Kant, in a letter to Marcus Hertz, repeats a question that has been raised by Solomon Maimon and others, uh, persons who have had many criticisms of the critique. The question is this, how does Kant account for the agreement between the a priori intuitions and the a priori concepts? They come together so perfectly. It looks almost contrived. Do you see? How is it that sensuous representations are properly taken up in just the right way by the pure concepts of the understanding? Uh, the, you know, the question is, it, it, it's almost like a kind of card trick, you know, or the shell game, sort of. Thing. Is it some Darwinian sort of thing that there might have been species that didn't do it the right way and they all went belly up and then, uh, you know, we came on the scene and we do it right. Is it, what, what kind of an argument is it? Kant says, to this I answer. I, I don't know that you'll find this a compelling answer. It's Kant's answer. To this I answer. All of this takes place in relation to an experiential knowledge only possible for us under these conditions. A subjective consideration to be sure, but one that is objectively valid as well, because the objects here are not things in themselves, but mere appearances. Consequently, the form in which they are given depends on us. What, what he's saying is, it, uh, he, he doesn't completely desubjectivize it. But he says, look, the pure categories, this is something that the cognizer is imposing on the sensuous manifold. And, and as this is the necessary and universal set of conditions for human understanding, it shouldn't be surprising that we all do it the same way. Of course we all do it the same way. But analogically speaking, we all conform to the same rules when we play chess. No surprise, because everything we're doing is governed by a rule structure. So, so, so again with Kant, he says, all of this takes place in relation to an experiential knowledge that is only possible for us under these conditions. A subjective consideration to be sure, but one that's objectively valid as well, because the objects here are not things in themselves, but mere appearances. Consequently, the form in which they are given depends on us. On the other hand, they are dependent on the uniting of the manifold in consciousness, that is, on what is required for the thinking and cognizing of objects by the understanding. It's only under these conditions, therefore, that we can have experiences. So to the extent that the categories, that, that, that the pure concepts of the understanding are universally distributed in creatures of a certain kind, are the necessary preconditions for the understanding. That the understanding itself, 
must merge with experience in the right way to constitute knowledge. To the extent that this is the case, we have an anthropological perspective on knowledge, but a universalist anthropological perspective. It can't be subjective in the sense that it is subject to the willy-nilly subjective states of a, of a percipient, because the knowledge claimed does not arise, is not grounded in perception. It's grounded in the pure concepts of the understanding as necessarily and universally distributed. I said that I would be performing a transcendental deduction in this room, and in case you hadn't noticed it, I did. That's it. Now, last week I uh, gave you Kant's two supreme principles, and I want to begin today's lecture with the supreme principle in relation to the understanding. This is a good starting point for the <coughs> issue before us today, which is the synthetic unity of our perception. It's a very difficult part of the first critique. We want to be systematic in exploring it. The supreme principle in relation to understanding is to quote Kant, that all the manifold of intuition should be subject to conditions of the original synthetic unity of apperception. That's one of those wonderful passages in the first critique that has eyes roll up, people read it a second and third time, consulted in German, consulted in Japanese, and, and uh, trying to get through it. But he does lay out the argument that clarifies what he means by this, and he attaches central importance to what is claimed regarding the synthetic unity of our perception. In fact, he goes so far as to say that the synthetic unity of our perception is, quote, the highest point to which we must ascribe all employment of the understanding. It's the pinnacle. I continue with the quote, even the whole of logic and conformably therewith transcendental philosophy itself. The quote continues, indeed this faculty of apperception is the understanding itself. You'll find that at B134. Now how does he wish to have this synthetic unity understood? It's certainly not merely a subjective state or process. So how does he wish to have this synthetic unity understood? It's not subjective, it's not some psychological state. Kant says this, the synthetic unity of consciousness is an objective condition of all knowledge. It is not merely a condition that I myself require in knowing an object, but as a condition under which every intuition must stand in order to become an object for me. Now this is addressed to the question of how various sensations become integrated and unified in consciousness, and then how it is that it inheres in my or your consciousness, and how all of this should be understood as distinct from mere subjectivity or psychological states. Well, step back for a moment and consider what's been, what has been established so far. If there are to be concepts at all, there must be some means by which to fashion them out of representations. Thus, some sort of categorical framework is necessary if entities are to be cognized as objects at all. Kant's table of categories, therefore, must match up with the properties that enter into anything standing as intersubjectively stable identifications, things that are universally agreed to by percipients of a certain kind. For it's only by way of these categories that objects can be conceptualized at all. And recall that additional resources are required if there is to be knowledge 
for understanding is grounded in rules, in, in an innate faculty that benefits from practice, but is at base the gift of Mother wit. Mother wit, yes. She's back. <laughs> well, so far so good. But just when this seems to be the last word, as progress is tracked from sensation to objective knowledge, something new and seemingly psychological enters into the equation, if there are to be concepts at all, namely apperception and its shadowy relatives, which Kant identifies as the empirical ego, a transcendental ego, and a self. This uh, matter of selves has, has whiskers, uh, as Professor Wiggins was among the first to uh, remind all of us a number of years ago. Uh, we can go back, uh, certainly, to the ship of Theseus. I don't know whether you are in the mood for legend in this kind of weather, particularly legends drawn from the sunny islands of the Mediterranean and the Mytilene coast. But Theseus is the one who was sent to Crete to liberate the Athenians from a burden that had been imposed by King Minos. And that burden was sacrifice, sacrificing Athenian youth to the king by putting them in the pit of a labyrinth where they would be devoured by a minotaur. So Theseus had to go off and do something about this. You know the story. He gets there. Minos's daughter falls in love with him. She shows him the best way to get out of the labyrinth just in case he's successful in getting down to the minotaur, killing the minotaur, and then has to get out. She gives him a golden thread that he can lay behind him as he works his way through this maze-like structure, and then all he has to do is follow that thread. Some of you will recall in, in Plato's Republic that we are as puppets on a string. We are acted upon by the gods in ways we cannot fathom. But there is one string we can pull back on, which is the golden thread of reason. And this, of course, is a gloss on that, on that myth, isn't it? Must be. So he does it. He kills the thing. He even promises to to, to meet Ariadne and to take her back to the Greek mainland. He says, I shall fetch you on, on Aulis. Wait for me. And he abandons her. You know the opera, Ariadne of Naxos. He's supposed to be picking her up and he abandons her. There's a myth surrounding that too, you know. He's a great, great hero. He's done heroic deeds, and therefore the gods need a special place for him. According to one myth, he is installed eternally in the heavens, where he sits on the stool of oblivion, so that he has a kind of immortality, but can't quite figure out how it was he, he got it. Well, the crazy Greeks. Um, now, the debate begins, because as, as Theseus's ship goes from island to island and place and port to port, celebrating his triumph year in and year out, pretty soon the ship's old boards have to be replaced by new boards. You see where this is going. At, one, at what point have you so replaced the original boards that it really isn't the ship of Theseus any longer? Or, if you had all of those old boards in a pile and constituted yet another ship out of them, would you now have the original, though the original in some sense had disappeared and now has reappeared, and before you know it, the philosophers are just mucking up what is otherwise a very good story. And it's a story that we get mucked up the minute we begin to consider ourselves. Because even in your tragic youth, you have a bunch of old cells that are being replaced even as you sit here. 
Your taste buds are going to be all brand new in less than a week. How on earth do you remember what a bad hot dog tasted like? Do you see that sort of thing? It's all brand new. I don't want you to smoke, but when mommy tries to frighten you by saying that you'll lose your taste for food, tell mommy those buds are replaced all the time. You just have to have a pause between cigars, that sort of thing. So with a body that's constantly undergoing change, the question arises, how is there a continuity of self, a continuity of the ego? Now the scholastic philosophers were more or less content following either Plato or Aristotle on this, that there is an essential self, there is an essential being that undergoes alteration but not change. That unless there is some enduring substance that just is the self, there really wouldn't be anything for the engines of change to be working on. And so an essentialism comes out of this. When Aristotle says famously that the sense in which Coriscus is musical is different from the sense in which Coriscus is a man, He's pointing to the difference between some accidental properties that we acquire in the course of a lifetime and some essential properties in virtue of which we are the kinds of things that we are. The medieval part of the story, well the scholastic part of this story, is itself a very interesting part of the story, but we've got to move on, regrettably and we move to Locke. Now, when you read Locke's essay concerning the human understanding and are told in 40 secondary sources that this is his broadside against Descartes' theory of innate ideas, keep two things in mind. The theory of innate ideas ascribed to Descartes, Descartes publicly denied, in print, he never attached himself to any such notion as that. And secondly, Descartes isn't discussed by Locke, though we have every reason to believe that during his period of self-exile, Locke surely read what Descartes had to say. I believe the right target here is probably the Cambridge Platonists, uh, surely more than, more than Descartes. And the Cambridge Platonists, Cudworth, Moore and Company, were actually gainfully employed in reviving Platonist thought in philosophy in the Anglophone, very much, uh, very much in opposition to the sorts of things that we would identify with the Baconian Newtonian perspective on reality and on knowledge. So, so Locke has a project when it comes to this, and the project is going, at, at a certain point, will we'll focus on this notion of a substantial or essential self, and on essences more generally. And that's when we find Locke declaring that you must make a distinction between real essences and nominal essences, you don't know the real essence of anything. The real essence is going to be at some Newtonian corpuscular level to which you do not have perceptual access. And as far as nominal essences go, these are entirely the gift of convention. That one chooses to call this tissue is, is, a, is, is a fact that arises in a given cultural context, historical context. We can imagine cultures and settings and people and languages where, where whatever it is we're trying to get at with the word tissue would not be what they were trying to get at with an entirely different word. As Locke points out, you could constitute something physically indistinguishable from Locke, but much cleverer than Locke. And, and you might go about describing that entity in terms quite different from the ones you'd use for Locke. And to illustrate the point, he gives us the famous instance of the prince and the cobbler. What, after all, goes into one's selfhood, personal identity, continuing ego, etc.? Well, simply all of the things present in your consciousness. 
And since nothing now present in your consciousness is actually based on something happening now, we can say that consciousness is just the repository of all the things that you remember from milliseconds ago to hours and days and years and months ago. Well, do this as a thought experiment. On a given night, a prince and a cobbler go to sleep. In the course of the night, the contents of the prince's consciousness are transferred to the cobbler. The contents of the cobbler's consciousness are transferred to the prince. And Locke says, quite persuasively, that on their, uh, on their arising, I grant you, quote, they are the same man, but not the same person. And you, you, you can, here's this uh, shoe cobbler who expects you to be <laughs> very decorous in his presence and bowing and scraping and all that sort of thing. And uh, that princely fellow, whom you know to be the prince, uh, wants to know if you need a new pair of heels, you see. As far as Locke's concerned, that's it. The contents of consciousness exhaust the self. Now, um, we are fortunate always. And by the way, it's one of the great tragedies today that we don't have this group around. You always need acute philosophers to keep your thinking clear and challenged. And you always need great wits to rein in the pretensions of philosophy. Now, fortunately, in the late 17th, early 18th century, the English-speaking world did have great wits, and they had a lot of fun with what science and philosophy happened to be producing in recent years. Um, they actually, formed, the ones I'm thinking about, formed a club. They knew each other. They formed a club named after Dr. Scriblerus. How many of you have ever read the memoirs of Martinus Scriblerus? Who wrote these memoirs? Oh, come on. John Arbuthnot. Do you not know that? Do you know the name of the club they formed? The Scriblerians. And the Scriblerians had a field day with things like <laughs> the productions of the Royal Society and John Locke's famous essay and so forth. Well, on this business of the prince and cobbler, you, you can get... Oh, by the way, you know the names of some Scriblerians. Swift, Pope, ringing bells now, Lilliput. <laughs> What are, they try <laughs> what are they trying to do on Lilliput? This is a scientific community. They're trying to get sunshine from cucumbers. They're persuaded that if the authorities will give them just some more funding, they might be able to produce so much of the stuff as to sell it cheaply. You, you get the picture here, don't you? There's a wonderful book by, by Christopher Fox, which I'd recommend to you, called... Uh, Locke and the Scriblarians. It, it's a good summer read. You, you, if you're a philosophy student, you'll like it quite a bit. They, they do a lot on metaphysics and relata. You, you, you'd enjoy it. But for the first serious uh, philosophical critique of the thesis, we turn to George Berkeley and to Berkeley's Alciphron. And Barclay's Alciphron, along with Thomas Reed's Inquiry, puts to the test the notion that you have exhausted uh, this concept of an enduring self by consulting no more than what the empiricists offer by way of the contents of consciousness. The argument is fairly straightforward. It's sometimes called the brave officer argument. And the brave officer argument is of the following form. Imagine a brave officer, call him B, who recalls vividly having been a boy once punished for stealing fruit from the orchard called the young boy A. 
Now consider many years hence a decorated general reflecting on the day he was decorated as a young officer called the aged General C who has a vivid recollection of being the young officer B and no recollection whatever of being the boy A. On the Lockean account it would seem that A equals B, B equals C, but A does not equal C. The principle of associativity is not honored and the alleged identity collapses. Now just in case you think that what Locke was offering was some sort of identity argument, that would be a successful challenge to it. Reed, as you might guess, has that challenge and then another one. The other one is quintessentially Reedian. The other one is that someone remembers having done something, no more makes him the one who did it. You, you have lunatics seven days a week vividly recalling having lost a battle in Belgium. They stand there with their hands inside their waistcoats. They affect a French accent. They wonder why the supplies came so late. They're from Portsmouth. You see. So, so Reed simply, he says, th this is what happens. Uh, there's a wonderful line of Reed's that conjectures and theories are the creatures of men. Uh, and nature seldom mimics these things, do you see? So, so when I say that my epitaph shall read, he died without a theory, I, I'm, I'm, I'm simply showing a very strong sympathy for a Scottish common sense philosophy that thinks we're generally, generally safe when we stick to systematic observation, when possible, measurement, and framing very modest propositions based on what is available to persons of ordinary perception, and that the further we get from that, the more turbid and turbulent the waters of metaphysics as they rush over us. It's a wonderful line of Edmund Burke's about, uh, about how we'll keep gabbing about certain things, quote, until the steely tomb heaps its mold on our pert loquacity. Those of us closer to that mold, I think, uh, probably find that a more chilling statement than you do. So, so, so now the other thing, though, is that uh, the, the the other disappointment with Locke is that you still have this entity reflecting on the contents of its consciousness. So in addition to certain logical problems with the thesis and common sense or counterintuitive problems with the thesis, it doesn't really do the job it's set out to do because you still have some sort of enduring X that must be the, the entity reflecting on the contents of consciousness. So, predictably, enter Hume. Hume. Quote, I think this is word for word, I must own that when I search for myself I can find nothing but a bundle of perceptions. He can find nothing but a bundle of perceptions. Now this is a predictable empiricist position on, on the question, but, but do follow what Hume is saying. Try to give some thought about anything that isn't finally reducible to thought about something that figures at the level of perception. Even if it's some sort of rearrangement of former percepts. To be thinking is to be thinking about something. Now you might just be thinking about relations of ideas, you know, that, that every, every number is equal to itself. But if you're conducting, if, if you're thinking about something you're granting a physical reality to, call it yourself, then you're thinking in property terms. 
You're thinking that you're sitting. You're thinking that you're tired. You're thinking that it was cold about a half hour ago till you got in this lecture hall, etc., etc. So, so what's, what you've got then is a bundle of perceptions. Now, you might ask the question, well, don't we need a percipient now observing the bundle of perceptions? After all, what constitutes the ground of the continuity of the entity in question? <coughs> and there, Hume offers this interesting reply. He says, look, think of a parade formation. Now, everyone marching in the parade is replaceable. And as long as when one party drops out, he is replaced by another one, the continuity of the formation is preserved, even though you have these otherwise incessant changes. So that it, it, this is almost a kind of a Jamesian stream of consciousness argument, this, this, this continuous flow of, of experiences, what William James referred to uh, rather poetically as the ever-passing present thought, do you see? So, the bundle of perceptions. What might Reed have to say about the bundle of perceptions and uh, Hume's skeptical position on his own self? And Descartes with the cogito and so forth. You, you know how Reed's going to misbehave when it comes to these philosophical productions, don't you? He says it seems to be a particular strain of humor in this man. He's referring to Hume. A particular strain of humor in this man. This author of deathless prose admired the world over by many that he is nonetheless not only doubtful about his own existence but about the very readership on whom his authority depends, do you see? As for Descartes, Reed says, a man who disbelieves his own existence is no more fit to be reasoned with than one that thinks he's made of glass. As for the bundle of perceptions, Reed said, it has always been my view that for there to be treason, there must be a traitor. And so if in fact there is this bundle of perceptions, presumably it's inhering in Hume. Now you'll find Reed so playful in these regards that you, you, you might think this is philosophy light. Re read the whole inquiry. These are asides. I think they're very much in the Scriblarian tradition, by the way. I mean, they're much later. Uh, um, the memoirs of uh, Dr. Scriblaris, I think, show up first in 1714. Reed's Inquiry is published in 1764. But there's already a great uh, respect for what Pope and Swift and company had, had, had produced. Now, Kant's position is uh, predictably entirely different from either the empiricist side of the equation or the Scottish common sense side of the equation, though, as I've said repeatedly, the, the longer I stay with this literature, the more convinced I am that Reed's inquiry in redacted, translated form mightily influenced Kant's thought. I'm joined in this judgment by Karl Americh's, who in my estimation is um, perhaps the best of our contemporary Kant scholars, now, now, at, now at Notre Dame. For Kant, it is a necessary feature of the human mind that experiences are unified in a single consciousness. It's only when there is consciousness of the result of the synthesis of the manifold that in a sense can rise to the level of a comprehended state or condition with content. The transcendental unity of our perception refers then to what are finally the necessary conditions for the unification of elements of, of empirical our perception. The, these things that are gleaned by the senses and give rise to sensations. And these sensations then 
uh, in the form of perceptions becoming subsumed under general categories. All this must be unified. You understand why it must be unified. If Jack is the one who senses the blue, and Jill is the one who senses the tree, and Frank is the one, you get the picture. There's no way any of this can be merged into a scene. It, 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 uh, nonetheless, there isn't anything in the stimulus itself that supplies the means of unification. This has to be an a priori power common to minds of a certain kind, namely minds of our kind. The, so the transcendental unity of our perception refers to what are finally necessary conditions for the unification of the various elements of empirical our perception. That this must operate a priori is established by the fact that nothing at the level of appearances themselves contains within it the means by which to establish such unification. It's not in the stimulus. What is required is what Kant refers to as an act of the imagination. This is at B154, and that section will repay close reading on your part. What's required is what Kant refers to as an act of the imagination, which is known not as a representation, but directly by way of the act itself. To quote Kant at B153, it is conscious to itself even without sensibility, do you see? That, that, that you, as a conscious entity, are aware of these powers that you have is not something engaged by or triggered by sensibility itself. This is something that would be there were there not sensibility. As this is a necessary and universal condition of, of experience itself, it is grounded in an a priori substrate which Kant calls the transcendental ego. Now, um, Save me from saying anything contemporary, please. It all begins to sound like the telegraph or something. But I do think it would be useful for persons uh, taking on the very difficult task of the self, writing on the self, to make a distinction between Kant's transcendental ego and Kant's empirical ego. Uh, most of the literature I'm familiar with has to do with what might, might be called the psychological dimensions of selfhood. The transcendental dimension is the necessary dimension. It, it's, it's what can be argued into place if no one were ever aware of oneself. It's not the fact that you're aware of yourself that these things happen. In fact, were there not the a, priori, the a priori conditions of the unification of empirical apperceptions, there wouldn't be any awareness at all. Do you know why? Because there wouldn't be any thought at all. That's what he meant when he said that the transcendental unity of apperception finally understood just is thought, do you see? As this is a necessary and universal condition, it's grounded in an a priori substrate, and that's the one that Kant refers to as the transcendental ego. James Van Cleve has summarized Kant's concept of this transcendental ego, contrasting it with the empirical ego. I want to read you a passage from Van Cleve, uh, but I, I also want you to note that I... Uh, not strongly disagree. That almost sounds like dyspepsia. I, I, I'd be quite reserved about the last sentence in this passage. Quote, In the philosophy of Kant, the transcendental ego is the thinker of our thoughts, the subject of our experiences, the willer of our actions, and the agent of the various activities of synthesis that help to constitute the world we experience. With hesitation, I, I, I say that that's a decent enough, quick summary. Now then he says, 
it is probably to be identified with our real or noumenal self. Where do you know that? We don't know things like that. This is where you, you, you want to engage in that exercise of Thomas Reed's of laying your hands across your lips. See, every time you're on the verge of saying, well, you know what it is noumenally, you want to say, well, you know what it is... <laughs> Must, mustn't do it. Um, at at uh, B490, at uh, A492, B520, the transcendental subject is equated by Kant with the self proper as it exists in itself. And that, I think, is what led Van, Van Cleve to say, well, you know, it's, it, it's, we, this, is, uh, this is the noumenal self. Kant is suggesting something that's equated with, not something that's known as. Now this is contrasted with an empirical ego, which is reached by way of introspection. The I, the self that accompanies all experience and consciousness. As a subjective feature of perception, it distinguishes one person from another. When you say things like, let me tell you something about myself. That, that's what you're referring to. You're not, that's not the transcendental ego, that's the cafe ego, do you see? Self-disclosure is a very effective form of ingratiation. Unfortunately, we learn this at a very early age, and so we become gabby for the next 70 years, do you see? Well, let me tell you about myself. To which the polite reply is, oh, please don't. Uh. <laughs> so against Hume, Kant offers this as a conclusion. It is absolutely necessary that in my knowledge all consciousness should belong to a single consciousness, that of myself. Do you see, Hume doesn't give us the belt the belonging. He has a kind of mechanism by which some, what, psychic stuff, perceptual stuff, bundled stuff, gets held together, uh, but, but not in a way that, 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 that could be known because there isn't a knower. He, Hume knows there's a knower, goodness sake, he's writing this. When Kant says this, he is not offering a factual claim based on introspection. Rather, it pertains to the logical form of all knowledge as necessarily relating to a faculty or power by which unification becomes possible. And this just is the faculty of apperception. So Kant is here to explain how a bundle of perceptions might rise to the level of human understanding. And in the end, how might we best summarize that, that explanation? I should tell you that, that he is respectful of Hume in these regards. Not, not just the fellow who awakened him from dogmatic slumber, but he sees Hume as the culmination, in, in Kant's day anyway, the culmination of, of an empirical tradition that in important respects includes Newton. You, you've got to be very careful about what part of this project you're going to jettison because you do not want the scientific productions growing out of systematic observation, measurement, etc. You don't want those to be casualties in a war of metaphysics. And in fact, Reed is also very respectful of Hume. I, shall I, I, I just give you a, a gloss on this, an aside on this, because I, I think these exchanges amuse you and the weather is cold. You should be repaid for your diligence and uh, so forth. Um, when Reed completed his inquiry, he, he did not want to publish it until Hume read it. 
just in case he grossly misrepresented Hume's position. But Reed didn't know Hume. Reed, Reed was not a party goer. He was a Presbyterian minister, actually, uh, in Aberdeen. Hume was down there in Edinburgh bothering the bishops. But they did have a friend in common, Hugh Blair. And Reed asked Blair to intercede to have Hume read the thing. Blair sends it to Hume. Hume returns it <laughs> unwrapped with a note saying that it has always been my view that Presbyterian divines should spend their time troubling each other and should leave philosophy to philosophers. <laughs> Very high-handed indeed. Um, Blair persisted, sent it back, and said, Davy boy, I think you better read this. So, so Hume did read it, and he wrote back to Reed glowingly and revealingly. He said, I must say, if there was one part of this quite remarkable work that I did not fully understand, it was a section in your chapter of seeing which you refer to as the geometry of visibles. Ah, oh, that's the thing that explodes the whole ideal theory. That, that, that's the part you want to understand. I don't think uh, Hume was big on geometry, by the way, but that, that's something else again. Um, and then Reed replies to Hume, and if you want the spirit of the Enlightenment, I, I think you'll find it in the manner in which Weed closes the correspondence with Hume. He says, quote, And although we here at Aberdeen, sir, are all good Christian men, we would prefer your company to that of St. Athanasius himself. And we fear that if you were to write no further in metaphysics, we would have nothing to talk about at all. So... Well, how does Kant finally explain how you get a bundle to rise to the level of understanding and thought? The explanation just is that transcendental argument that establishes the a priori basis on which objective knowledge depends and the necessary and universal a priori basis on which such knowledge is possessed by a single consciousness. Thank you. So here we are, eighth week, and we come now to what Kant refers to as the much needed discipline of reason. Remember, what's promised in the first critique is that reason will become its own pupil. And it is by way of the paralogisms and antinomies that Kant will expose reason's tendency to overstep its legitimate grounds. And when Kant refers to reason overstepping its legitimate grounds, you want to take that literally. It, it's overstepping the grounds that a juridical proceeding would find to be uh, impermissible, the, the, the overreaching, overstepping. It, it is, as it were, unlawful. The paralogisms and antinomies are developed late in the critique, but the groundwork is done quite early. In fact, the groundwork for these is done just after the transcendental aesthetic. Recall that under the transcendental doctrine of the elements, part one is devoted to the transcendental aesthetic. This is followed immediately uh, with, the, with what Kant heads the transcendental logic. And it's his aim there to distinguish transcendental logic from general logic. Remember the letter to Marcus Hertz where he says, I have a mania for systematization. And I'm sorry to regale you with these, these subheadings and sub-subheadings and the like, but Kant found it very important to keep the books orderly on these subjects. So he wants to make now a distinction 
uh, between transcendental logic and general logic, and general logic is further divided into what he refers to as analytic and dialectic. And it's that second one that is the cause of all the mischief. Analytic logic is just the formal logic bequeathed by Aristotle, and it stands as what Kant refers to as the canon of judgment. Dialectic is another matter entirely. The formal logic that is a canon of judgment is now used not as a canon, but Kant says as an organon. It's a method, it's treated as if it were a method of discovery, which in the end becomes, says Kant, the sophistical art of giving to ignorance the appearance of truth. So it's the dialectical logic that's going to be the culprit, as illustrated in the paralogisms and the antinomies. Those who are guilty here fail to realize the utter dependence that knowledge claims have on the proper assimilation of appearances to categories. Thus, both the empiricists and the rationalists have wandered in darkness and confusion, he says. He's going to turn in something of a pathologist's report. There's a point where he refers to the euthanasia of reason. He's quite, you know, you think of him as a kind of door Prussian pietist family background. He does have a lot of fun in the first critique. He's got these turns of phrase and he's got these characterizations of people. Um, and as I've told you, at supper, he was really a barrel of monkeys, according to some of his friends. You'd have to be there. Well, what is a paralogism? Kant defines it thus. Quote, it is a syllogism, which is fallacious in form, be its content what it may. His specific target here is the transcendental paralogism. Here we have a transcendental grounding. That is, we, we're going to have a, a proposition that is grounded in what is recognized to be a necessary condition or enabling condition. But it's a transcendental ground that then leads to a formally invalid conclusion. It's precisely because such syllogisms are transcendentally grounded that he says it is in the nature of human reason and gives rise to an illusion which cannot be avoided but may be rendered harmless. Do you see, once you've established a ground as transcendental, it, it becomes a necessary part of our cognitive apparatus. So it's not something that you, you can abandon. It isn't even something that, that, that you would be aware of in a self-conscious way. So it's by way of Kant's critical uh, analysis that he will at least draw attention to this. And although we can't stop doing this sort of thing, we can at least tame it and know when we're doing it, you see. He's establishing the bounds of sense and reason. And so once you know what the boundary conditions are, it doesn't mean you're not going to cross over into territory that's not really reasons to claim, but at least when you do it, you'll know you're doing it, and you'll be ready for a scolding. What's common to such syllogisms is a lack of empirical premises. So although they are lacking in necessary empirical content, we nonetheless use them, says Kant, to conclude from something which we know to something else of which we have no concept, and to which, owing to an inevitable illusion, we yet ascribe objective reality. What the paralogisms have in common is an attempt to derive rationally from the transcendental unity of consciousness some factual synthetic propositions about the soul or the self. The basic mistake is confusing the transcendental necessity of how we must regard ourselves. That's the transcendental part. How we must regard ourselves with what we are as noumena. 
So rational psychology thus wrongly argues from a transcendental necessity to an empirical discovery of the thing in itself, which in this case is the real self as in itself it really is. That's the failure of rational psychology and also the lifelong mission of rationalists to establish the true essence of the soul, the soul spirit. Kant says at A340, I conclude from the transcendental concept of the subject, which contains nothing manifold, the absolute unity of this subject in itself. That's the paralogism. So the first paralogism, contra Descartes' cogito, and what Kant calls the rational doctrine of the soul, is defeated by the very transcendental logic of the case. Now, rationalists long sought to establish that the soul can be known, and can be known to be at once a substance, simple and indestructible. That is, rationalists had good arguments for the immortality of the soul. Such good arguments as to claim that the immortality of the soul could be settled as a matter of knowledge itself. But of course, if such knowledge actually were reached through reason alone, Kant's entire project would be defeated. It would amount to the claim that noumena are directly given in experience. The arguments for this contain no empirical premises. Moreover, the pure categories are empty of the very objects that would be accessible to experience alone. You'll recall that famous maxim, concepts without intuition are empty at A52, B76. Concepts can be applied solely to appearances as these are grounded in pure intuitions. Well. Knowledge, as you now know, depends on the full cooperation of sensibility and understanding, not on either alone. Thus, what is beyond sensibility is beyond knowledge. He made all this clear as early as B147, where he writes, quote, For if no intuition could be given corresponding to the concept, the concept could still be thought so far as its form is concerned but would be without any object, and no knowledge of anything would be possible by means of it. So far as I could know, there would be nothing, and could be nothing, to which my thought could be applied. You'd be thinking about nothing. You know, in the first uh, edition of the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the old Macmillan edition, you might amuse yourselves by looking up the article on nothing, where an analytical philosopher says part of the difficulty of analyzing the concept of nothing is there's no settled position on how to conjugate the verb to not. Thus, such transcendental use of the understanding independent of sensibility is simply a mistake. Generally, uh, one of the illusions of reason. Seeking knowledge of things that are independent of experience is seeking noumena, and it's doomed to fail. You want to consult A246 B303. And this includes the search for the noumenal self. It includes the search that was conducted by Descartes and by Leibniz. Rather than uncovering the noumenal self, Descartes and Leibniz confused the logical self of propositions with an ontological discovery of something, you see. They confused the transcendental necessity if there is to be a unification uh, of the uh, sensuous manifold the necessary condition for the thing itself. Alas, quote, this is Kant at B421. Now this is where he's actually in the heart of the discussion of the paralogisms. Quote, 
From all this, it is evident that rational psychology owes its origin simply to misunderstanding. The unity of consciousness is only unity in thought, by which alone no object is given, and to which therefore the category of substance, which always presupposes a given intuition, cannot be applied. So arguments to the effect that we can directly know a soul substance, that there's a rational proof of a soul substance, is just again based on a mistake. The second paralogism turns to the putative simplicity of the soul. So now we've seen that the argument to the effect that rationality by itself can establish that there is a soul substance, that's just one of the misunderstandings of rational psychology. And now what? The soul is a simple substance. That's a second claim, which Kant refers to as the Achilles of all dialectical inferences. He says that at A351. The main argument for the soul's simplicity goes something like this. Well, the total thought, were one's total thought, the combination of thoughts held by more than one soul, there would be no unity of thought. And absent unity, no proposition could be expressed. You know, it's uh, uh, Ned Block's Chinese nation, you know, that, so that, that everybody gets a separate piece of paper, but uh, no, there's no place to put all this together in one unified, simple substance. At A352, Kant, in relation to this, says, it's therefore possible only in a single substance, which not being an aggregate of many, is absolutely simple. That's the conclusion of the argument. But the required conclusion, says Kant, doesn't follow. First, the proposition that requires the unity of a thinking subject, if multiple representations are to yield a single representation, is certainly not an analytic proposition. In other words, the concept of the unity of a thinking subject is not synonymous with or included in the concept of multiple representations condensed into a single representation. Therefore, the proposition is not established by way of the principle of identity. In other words, it's not a claim capable of vindication by reason alone. Well, nor can it, as a synthetic proposition, be known a priori, for a single representation could be derived by the concerted action of a collective. Nor is it empirically confirmed, for nothing in experience is generative of the logical necessity that attaches to the proposition itself. We see that the alleged simple substance is not the content of an experience, but merely a subjective condition of knowledge. That's at A354. So challenged here is the alleged objective reality of the soul's simplicity. You see, he's, he's just knocking these bottles off one, one after another. He concludes as follows, quote, it's obvious that in attaching I to our thoughts, we designate the subject of inherence only transcendentally without noting in it any quality whatsoever. In fact, without knowing anything of it, either by direct acquaintance or otherwise. Simplicity of the representation of the subject is not knowledge of the simplicity of the subject itself. And so the whole of rational psychology is involved in the collapse of its main supports. Well, what about the third paralogism? Um, that of an enduring self. Of course, at your age, you are immortal. Now, some of us are much more concerned about the third paralogism than others might be. Yesterday was birthday number 74. Don't send cake. So you understand that I have a very focused attention on this third paralogism which promises to give us nothing less than an enduring, continuing self. Here's the paradigmatic argument. That which is conscious of the numerical identity of itself at different times is, insofar, 
a person. Now the soul is conscious of it, uh, its unchanging, etc., over time. Therefore, it is a person, which is to say there's something there that survives alterations. You know Kant makes a distinction between change and alteration. Substance undergoes alteration all the time, but it doesn't change. You can do lots of things with gold, it stays gold. And lots of things happen to a self, but the essential, the substantial, etc., etc., that's what endures over all mere alterations. Well, is there an enduring, persisting, persisting self or soul that could be knowable by way of the arts of reason? There is indeed a case for the self or person, a transcendental self, as a necessary concept to account for the unity of our perception. We've been through all that. But not as an object of knowledge. As Kant says at A366, we can never parade it as an extension of our self-knowledge through pure reason and as exhibiting to us from the mere concept of the identical self an unbroken continuation of the subject. Granting the unity and simplicity of the soul substance, there's still no guarantee of its continuing existence. He says later at B414, Thus, the permanence of the soul, regarded merely as an object of inner sense, remains undemonstrated and indeed indemonstrable." Close quote. To which I reply, Now, what the paralogisms make clear is that reason, liberated from necessary discipline, seeks to go beyond its own transcendental grounding, to what is finally the transcendent, and therein lies the illusion. If you want to get to heaven, you will not do so by way of reason alone, you will not do so by way of the understanding, nor will you do so by correctly subsuming the, manif the sensuous manifold correctly under the pure concepts of the understanding. So what's left to you, I should think, is prayer. Let me move now to the antinomies of pure reason. It's in the transcendental dialectic at A339, B397, that Kant lists the three pseudo-rational dialectical syllogisms productive of illusory knowledge, the first of these, the first of the three being the paralogisms. Now as we've seen, these find one drawing inferences from transcendental concepts to particular inferences, that is from concepts lacking empirical content to some claimed known fact about the real world. The second form of, uh, of uh, uh, pseudo-rational uh, syllogisms finds one drawing inferences from a series of appearances to the transcendental concept of the absolute totality of conditions, and this is where the antinomies set in. The third form, which I do hope to have time to get to, the third form of pseudo-rational inference moves from the synthetic unity of all one does know by way of the understanding to what one could not know by way of the same concepts, an inference to the ens entium, an inference to God. And here we have what Kant calls the ideal of pure reason. Whereas the paralogisms feature conjectures without empirical content, the antinomies are rich in empirical content in which nonetheless yet another set of fallacies tends toward what Kant calls the euthanasia of pure reason. The paralogisms generate illusions regarding the subject of thought, that is, regarding the self or soul, but now a different class of illusions set in, a, di a class of illusions that, quote, arises when reason is applied to the objective synthesis of appearances. 
The paralogisms pertain to the unwarranted reach of reason toward a noumenal self or soul. The antinomies are exemplified by unwarranted rational inferences toward the objects of knowledge, toward what Kant calls the world. This being, as he says at A420, quote, the absolute totality of all existing things. Well, what about the world? The world is to be understood as the ultimate source of all appearances, all objects, all events. So understood in these terms, the burning question is whether we can know the world through pure reason. And the antinomies are intended to illustrate what Kant refers to as a necessary skeptical method when it comes to addressing a question of that kind. And he makes a very sharp distinction between skepticism and the skeptical method. Let, let me read this passage very quickly. I'm sorry it's so long, but it's a, a particularly informing one in Kant. This method of watching, or rather provoking a conflict of assertions, not for the purpose of deciding in favor of one or the other side, but of investigating whether the object of controversy is not perhaps a deceptive appearance which each vainly strives to grasp, and in regard to which, even if there were no opposition to be overcome, neither can arrive at any result, this procedure, I say, may be entitled the skeptical method. It's altogether different from skepticism, a principle of technical and scientific ignorance which undermines the foundations of all knowledge. So the skeptical method is the one that puts uh, to the test competing claims. It's, it's not doubtful about our capacity for objective knowledge, but it applies the skeptical method as a test of what is available to us by way of objective knowledge. So the process of euthanasia begins when reason appropriating from the understanding concepts whose valid function pertains solely to sensuous intuitions. The proper deployment of the pure concepts of the understanding is to subsume intuitions under them and thereby make the objective world thinkable, to make possible nothing less than experience itself. But all that is sensible is not for that reason thinkable. Note, too, that the pure and transcendental concepts issue from the understanding, not from reason as such. And this creates the possibility of metaphysical mischief. Look, reason can contrive all sorts of things, the imagination, spontaneity. You can put together worlds that no one has ever experienced or ever will experience. You can contrive possibilities that constitute the, the, the art and measure of science fiction. But these are not things you can know. These are not things that fall under the heading of understanding. Reason can produce a wide range of possibilities that go beyond the reach of understanding properly understood. Understanding being that amalgam now of the sensuous intuitions and the pure concepts properly experience on the concepts properly assembled. Reason is able to liberate concepts of the understanding from the limitations imposed by possible experience. That's what reason can do. It frees the understanding of the otherwise necessary bondage that it should have to experience. By way of this liberation, reason would now extend the concepts beyond the empirically accessible, and therein we find what is illusory. But now reason would go beyond all this, reaching for absolute totality. It's not enough to subsume representations under general concepts and thus possess a genuine experience. No, reason now overextends itself to reach nothing less than the totality, the world. And in so doing, reason converts the concept, otherwise empirically supplied, into some sort of transcendental idea that is so liberated from what is given in intuition as to be beyond understanding. 
Now, having established how the process works, Kant is then in a position to examine his four antinomies of pure reason and illustrate the illusions arising from each. If you, as we all hope you do, spend long hours engaged in what I sometimes call cafe metaphysics, ideally suited to 2 a.m., 3 a.m., sixth cup of coffee, chin in your hand, chum looking at you with sort of drooping eyelids as you ask whether the world had a beginning or whether it has existed from all eternity, whether there really is free will, etc., etc. Well, you're in the game of the antinomies. And if you're actually believing that with one more cup of coffee you're going to settle this, Kant is your remedy. <laughs> the four antinomies are divided into two categories. Two of them are what Kant calls mathematical antinomies, and two are what he calls dynamic or dynamical antinomies. What makes the first two mathematical is that they pertain to that world of objects that exist in space and time, and so they have a scalar or uh, magnitude type dimension. Is the world finite? Is it limitless? Is everything divisible? Are there indivisible wholes? The dynamical antinomies arise from very different questions. Is the world to be understood as the outcome of strict and mechanical causation? Must there be behind everything some one causal power, itself free of causal constraints? If there is such freedom, then that uncaused source must stand outside the order of spatio-temporal causation. Is there then an absolutely necessary being? I told you, and we even time to spare here. Is there then an absolutely necessary being standing as the uncaused originator? You know, is there intelligent design sort of thing? Remember Aristotle in the physics. If the art of shipbuilding were in the wood, we'd have ships by nature. So this is a sensible question. It's a sensible question. We get in trouble when we think at the level of knowledge we have the answer. The first antinomy is what Kant refers to as the cosmological antinomy. And these are set up in the form of a thesis and an antithesis. Here's the thesis. The world has a beginning in time and a limit in space. Antithesis. The world is infinite in temporal duration and spatial extent. We're at A426, B454. The second antinomy is the ontological antinomy thesis. Substance and substances in the world are ultimately composed of simple parts. Antithesis. Nothing simple is ever to be found in the world, thus everything is infinitely divisible. The third antinomy is the antinomy of causality. Here's the thesis. Causality in accordance with laws of nature is not the only kind of causality. There must be a causality of freedom. And the antithesis, everything in nature takes place in accord with deterministic laws alone. And the fourth antinomy is the theological antinomy. Thesis. There must be a necessary being as the cause of the whole sequence of contingent beings, either as its first member or underlying it. And the antithesis, no such being exists inside or outside the world. In the Paralogisms of Pure Reason, Kant put rational psychology on notice, offering a refutation of any proposition by which the soul or self could be known noumenally. 
Now by way of the antinomies, he will set the same limits on cosmology and theology and causality. Reason must learn to discipline itself and spare itself self-delusional conclusions. Neither experience nor pure reason, as now properly assessed by Kant, by a sound metaphysical method that is, can establish any of this as knowledge. And this, after all, is to note yet again the limits of sense and reason. Now on the question, um, is there any place for God? And here I, I, I want to say, this is a good place to be brief because the alternative to being brief is eight weeks of lectures. It's at the end of the first critique that Kant is setting the stage for the, for the critique of practical reason, for, for his moral philosophy. In the antinomy regarding causality, Kant does take up the question of free will and determinism. He makes, by the way, the very interesting observation that from a moral point of view, it's not necessary to prove freedom. It's sufficient that it be thinkable. That is, from a moral point of view, it is sufficient for the actor to act on the supposition that the chosen course of action is authentically his own. That, that's, that would be a topic for one of the eight lectures on the second critique. But Kant says that um, in, in referring to the laws of freedom, sounds paradoxical, doesn't it? The laws of freedom. He says, well, look, what, what do we mean by that? On the assumption that at a choice point, there really is a choice, which is to say, it is within your power of agency to go left or right. At any such choice point, the decision you make, if it is a decision, which is different from flipping a coin, if it is a decision, there must be some reason for choosing left or right. Which is to say there must be some principle that guides the choice. And the more consequential the choices, the more fundamental must the principle be. You might think that when it comes to the most consequential choices, there would be a ruling principle that would cover all of them, all such choices. Conjure this, a being or entity, of such a nature that at any and every consequential choice point, the principle that governs the choice is an ideal principle, a flawless principle, a principle applicable over all such cases and always right. Call that God. Now, what Kant is offering then, re remember he had already been instructed by, by the monarchy to write no further on religious subjects and, and uh, uh, he, he, he obeyed as it were. Um, this was not a good time to be drawn into wrangles of a, of a religious nature, uh, closing decades of the 18th century in the German speaking world. But Kant is not offering some sort of fig leaf for there's some sort of veiled uh, theology here. Kant will reach the concept of God by way of morality. That is, he, the steps will be primarily anthropological, not theological. It will be something in human nature that triggers or guides thoughts of a certain kind, recognizing all the way that as far as we will get with that kind of argument, we'll never reach knowledge itself. So yes, uh, even in the first critique, there's ample room for the sorts of theological issues engaged by the issue of free will and determinism, engaged by morality itself. But neither experience nor pure reason, now properly assessed by a sound metaphysical method, 
will establish any of this as knowledge. And this, after all, is to note yet again just what are the limits of sense and reason. Our powers of knowing have real limits, even as they make nature itself possible. And this, after all, was the very point of the first critique. Thank you.